punish or judge have victory over all the gods of Egypt, the spiritual forces or demons who spiritually empower Egypt. I am the Lord. But the blood will be a sign on the houses where you are. When I see the blood, I will pass over you. The verb is related to Hebrew word for Passover. Yes. Nothing terrible will hurt. No plague will destroy. Will destroy you when I punish or strike the land of Egypt. You are always to remember this day and celebrate it with a feast of the Lord. Your descendants are to honor the Lord with this feast from now on. You are to observe it throughout your generations as a perpetual statute ordinance or requirement. For this feast, you must eat bread made without yeast, unleavened bread for seven days. On the first day, you are to remove all the yeast or leaven from your houses. No one should eat any yeast, anything leavened or leavened from the first day until the seventh day or that person will be cut off from Israel. You are to have holy oh, meetings, God. sacred or solemn convocation on the first and last days of the feast. You must not do any work on these days. The only work you may do is to prepare your meals. You must celebrate or keep guard the feast of unleavened bread because on this very day, I brought your divisions of people host military designation out of Egypt. So all of your descendants must celebrate this day. This is a law that will last from now on perpetual statute ordinance or requirement throughout your generations. In the first month of the year, you are to eat bread made without yeast, unleavened bread, from the evening to the 14th day until the evening of the 21st day to commemorate their rapid departure. For seven days, there must not be any yeast or leaven in your houses. Anybody who eats yeast, something leavened or leavened, during this time, either as an Israelite native citizen in the land or a non-Israelite alien or sojourner must be cut off from the community or congregation assembly of Israel. During this feast, you must not eat anything made with yeast or leavened. You must only eat bread made without yeast on leavened bread wherever you live. This is the word of the Lord. This is the word of the Amen, amen. Yes, so that was that was a wonderful reading and a retelling of exactly what Yahweh explained to Moses. Mm -hmm. He said, Moses, this is what I want you to do, and then I want you to take this information, I want you to give it to the Israelites, and then the Israelites, uh, they, they swallowed that and they did exactly what Yahweh said. Now, the reason why it was so easy for them to do it is because they just came off the heels of seven or eight divine miracles. Yes. I mean, they literally saw God move in Egypt and they saw him rain down destruction. Yes. Uh, and you know, this episode, if I could put a time frame on it, I would say that between Moses and Yahweh meeting at Mount Sinai, when he gets the call to go, uh, that would have probably happened around uh, Rosh Hashanah, which is like September, October. Uh, it took him a little while to go from Mount Sinai to back to Egypt, but on the way back, he meets Aaron, yes. and then on top of that, he also has to do a circumcision. So I would, I would estimate that they would get into the land of Egypt somewhere in the winter months. So we're talking about somewhere around January, uh, December, January. And then for all of those events to take place, him confronting Pharaoh, and Pharaoh uh, denying to let the people go, and then they actually experience the exodus I would give that another three-month window, and then we know, of course, that it took them three months to get from Egypt to meet Yahweh on Sinai. So you have a cycle of three-month segments, mm -hmm. three cycles of three-month segments, and I'll tell you why that's important right now to us in 2021 as we get deeper into this, this conversation. But realize, for those of you who may not be quite familiar with the story, the, the Passover story, and what happened, it was a contention between two nations. So you've got the nation of Israel that's nestled inside the nation of Egypt. Now they get to Egypt because Yahweh wants to preserve the Israelites. They are the descendants of Abraham, and so through Joseph, who was raised up in Pharaoh's court, as you know, you consider him like the vice president at the time. He is raised up, and he 
is actually, actually the saving grace for his entire family. They moved to the land of Goshen under Joseph's, direct, Joseph's direction. So Joseph is seeing everything from Yahweh's perspective. He has a higher order, a higher principle that he is negotiating on his family's behalf. So he's like, when you get into, into uh, Pharaoh's court, he's going to ask you some questions, tell them to your shepherds, because you know, the Egyptians, they really don't like shepherds, and so uh, he's going to ask you where you want to live. Otherwise... If you just tell him, you know what, you're Joseph's family, he's going to make you stay in Egypt. And Yahweh doesn't want us to be in Egypt. You know, so he's seeing things, you know, far beyond what the, the standard person would see in their lifetime. He's going for generations. And he's saying, okay, we need to find a land that's going to keep us safe. And then we're going to occupy that land. And we're going to stay there. It's going to be protected until Yahweh moves us out. So they're in Goshen because Joseph demanded that his family move to Goshen. Yes. Now, we get to the, 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 the ten, ten plagues. The ten plagues. And during the ten plagues, it's a contention between Pharaoh and God. Now, God set the stakes because he said to Moses, he said, you're going to be like uh, God, and Aaron is going to be like the prophet. So you're going to say what I want you to say. You're going to act in my place. Aaron is going to be the visible spokesperson to Pharaoh, and whenever Pharaoh decides that he won't do something, then between you and Aaron, you're going to command certain things to take place, and it's going to happen visibly in real time. So this isn't like, okay, we pray to God, and we expect something to happen, and then it takes like two or three years to manifest. This is like within 24 hours, these things that he declares are going to manifest. So that's the way that they're operating. My first question, and, and we have some amazing scholars online, so don't be bashful, don't be shy. We're going to ask these questions. We want you guys to answer these questions, you know, and, and come, with, come with your deep thoughts because we want to learn. We all want to learn together. So the first question is, we know it was a contention between Egypt and Israel. I want to know what was Israel's biggest mistake. Like, how did they get into this position? Out of all the nations in the world, uh, why did these plagues come to Egypt? You know, why, why couldn't it be another nation? Or why didn't it happen in another nation? Why, why was it centrally located around Egypt? And uh, scholars, please, anyone on the line, uh, give, give, us, give us your take on why Egypt. Listen, don't all go at once. Don't all go at once. I, I, I see everybody making a mad dash for the microphone because they want to answer this question so bad. One at a time. Come on. Don't make me call some names. <laughs> Hello? Uh, excuse me. Good night. What was the question? <laughs> Why why did these plagues come to Egypt? What what was what was the greatest or what what was their I guess what was their greatest offense that actually caused these plagues to happen to them to this nation in particular? Well, from way back in Gleaners, I was taught that uh uh for the stubbornness of Pharaoh's heart. You know, uh, these things were brought on the churn of Egypt. That's my simple answer right now. <laughs> That's a very good answer. That's not very simple at all. It's a very complex answer. Anyone else? Okay, my take on it would be that um, the gods chose some people were oppressed and so oppressed by the Egyptians, and, and as a result, they, they um, were punished by one plague after another. That's also a great answer. And who else wants to chime in? I'm just breathing right now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so, you know, actually, that's exactly why it happened. It was because of Yahweh said it himself to both Moses and Aaron, he said it's because of the stubbornness of Pharaoh's heart that he won't let this nation go. 
Now, Pharaoh experienced something that very few leaders of a country experience. Uh, today, it's, it's not really as potent as it was back then. Uh, what was happening is you had God, he had decided that at this particular time, he needed this nation to exit the nation that they were living in, to go into a particular place, to come and fellowship with him, to worship with him. Now, it's very rare for God in these days to call a group of people out of a nation and demand that the government let the people go. Because most countries around the world, they are democracies. And so you have a lot of freedoms, you have a lot of rights. But what happened with the Israelites is that the government took away their freedom. Yes. They noticed that there was something peculiar and different about these people. And so the government took away their freedoms, their rights, their privileges. And so here is God now negotiating on behalf of his people. Mm-hmm. And he's saying, listen, I need my people to come out, out of the bondage to come and worship me. We don't really understand that as, 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 as you know, as much as we've seen dictatorships and as much as we've seen, you know, these other types of governments where you have this one ruler who is an authoritative ruler. And he's saying, this is what must happen for all of my subjects. We, we've never seen in this day and age God actually try to pull a people out uh, yet, but I guarantee you, if things continue to uh, progress as they are with how the governments are moving, we may very well see that come up within the next 10 years. We have nations just set certain standards, and they say this is the standard of worship, this is the standard of operation, and that is something that always provokes God to now move on behalf of his people to say, okay, now I need these people to come out of this type of bondage and hardship so that they can worship me. And so my next question to those of you who may not understand the significance of Passover, one of the things I always said in the scripture that uh, my sister Anika read was that this was supposed to be a perpetual feast. Perpetual means this is something that will continue until Yeshua's return. Now, what has happened in, in the church is we've taken most of those feasts and we've said, okay, since Yeshua died and he resurrected, that means those feasts no longer need to be observed. And so you kind of take Leviticus chapter 23 and you, you dump a lot of those feasts uh, into the wastebasket. You say, okay, uh, let's take this unleavened bread. Like, you know, could you imagine today that this is Passover, right? So tomorrow will be unleavened bread. Could you imagine today that you told people, listen, you have to celebrate unleavened bread for seven days, and for seven days there can't be any yeast or any leaven in your house. Mm-hmm. And so that means that you have to go through all the packaged food that you have, you know, all the cookies and the ramen noodles and whatever else you have there, and you have to take all of that food, and you have to put that in a box, mm-hmm. and you have to take that and either give it away or throw it in the trash or find somewhere outside of your house to put that in. But the Israelites, they do this religiously every year. For seven days, they take, you know, and you calculate it. So you say, okay, Passover is about six weeks away. So what we're going to do is we're going to finish up all the bread and yeast that we have in the house so that by the time Passover hits, we don't have any of this in our homes. But could you imagine in the 21st century, you telling people, that, that, hey, listen, if you want to observe unleavened bread the right way, mm-hmm. you've got to get rid of all of the yeast and all of the leaven in your house. Like I said before, the Israelites, they submitted to this mm-hmm. because they saw the events in Egypt. First time, it's like they saw these things happen like two weeks ago. So they're like, okay, God is at the place now where he is not playing. He's very serious. I don't want to be on the wrong side of God. To see. If he tells me to get all the yeast out of my house, then what am I going to do? I'm going to get all the yeast out of my house. I don't need this stuff in my house. But because we're so far removed from this, these events, and because we've entered into this kind of, of I would guess we're in a, in a spiritual daze, uh, you know, and we're relying on grace so heavily. Since we're in that kind of position, we take all of what God has said, even the things that he said should be perpetual, and we kind of pack them up neatly in a box and put them to the side in a discard pile. And we say, okay, because God 
is, is not showing forth his anger because we don't see the plagues and because we don't see these things, then God really isn't uh, requiring us to keep these commands. It's not something that we're supposed to do. So my question, and I, I want to know, you know, and it could be a simple answer, yes or no, or you can give some kind of context as to what you, what you feel or what you believe or what you've been taught. Is Passover still relevant in 2021? Uh, are these feasts still relevant? Are we supposed to keep these feasts in 2021? And uh, anybody can answer. As, uh, as we delve deeper into what Passover is, a lot of us didn't understand the whole relevancy and the concept of what Passover meant to uh, the people of Israel. So here you go now, you have a nation that was commanded of God to keep this particular uh, celebration, a nation called the children of Israel, whereas you had Gentiles nation, we are considered the Gentiles, I suspect. We weren't given that direct commandment. It was given to the people of Israel. But the scripture also says that if you have people that are sojourning in your country, Gentiles perhaps, mm -hmm. they also yeah. must celebrate in this Passover else you'll have to cast them out. So mm -hmm. here now we have a little debate going on. What's the correct perception? What's the right way? Should we celebrate the whole seven days of event? Or should we just say, as you mentioned, Jesus paid it all. We don't have to do this anymore. Mm -hmm. Was and a question to a question, was he speaking to the children of Israel or was he speaking to the nations? That's a beautiful question. I, I wonder if somebody would like to jump in and answer that question. Well, this, this is, is one, one of the quietest. This is one of the quietest. I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna jump oh. on this one here for a minute. Oh, I thought you were gonna. Yes, sir. Uh, I'm gonna start with the uh, with the last one. Jesus paid it all, and I believe that uh, when we go back to uh, Jesus paid it all, then that kind of put uh, a full stop. That means that's the end of the story, and we say we should no longer. Celebrated, therefore, he fulfilled it. But when we when we say Jesus paid it all, it is true he's our Passover lamb. But what the church is doing is that they put the end to the story. So now the problem becomes: should we continue doing it, or was he speaking to all? Well, if you looked at it clearly from God's perspective, we need to first understand the history as we come along. Who are the Jews? Who those Israelites? Who were they? If we go back to Exodus, he told Moses right before when they came out of a uh, uh, when the twelve spies came out, and uh, they say that uh, they they cannot possess the land and this and that. God said, "Look, I chose you for my possession, even though the whole world is mine." So why should Yahweh say that He chose the Israelites specifically for a reason? Why? As a template, He may say what the whole world. So Yahweh praying was always about the whole world. So now, fast forward. When we get to Yeshua, question is, was he speaking to only the nation of, uh, of the Jews or was he speaking to all? Of course not. He was speaking to all. It seems like somehow this doesn't apply to us. But here we read from Exodus. Clearly, he said, those who stay with you, they must observe it. I believe my brother is having some internet issues. Can, can anybody hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Yeah, did he, did he come up YouTube? Yes. yes. Okay, hopefully he, he Joe's on fire, so he's probably preaching right now to himself. Joe, if you're, if you're there, uh, we can't hear you, my brother. So he might be experiencing some, some internet issues. I believe I know where he was going with that train of thought. Yeah. Uh, you know, so 
to, to, to piggyback, piggyback on what he was saying until he comes back in. When, when Yahweh instituted these days, when he instituted these days, he, he, called, he did not call them as the church calls them, Feast of the Israelites. Because as we say, these are Jewish feasts. The Bible never says that. Yahweh says that these are feasts of Yohivave. Yohivave is the Hebrew name for Yahweh, the, the four letters, Y H E H. So he, he calls these the feasts, the King James calls them the feasts of the Lord. So they're not feasts as in these are days that are only belong to the Israelites. These actually do not belong to the Israelites, they belong to Yahweh. And he institutes them because he's, he's set up a particular calendar that he is following to a T. Yes. All of the critical events from heaven, there are only seven major events, believe it or not, that are critical from heaven's standpoint. All of the critical events from heaven's standpoint line up with one of these seven feasts. And you can see it through the life and the death of Yeshua. Yeshua was born uh, around September, October. So, you know, those who are convinced that he was born in December or December 25th, you, you do some research and you find that there were multiple pagan gods that were born on December 25th. Uh, Yeshua has nothing to do with Christmas. He was actually born during the Feast of Trumpets. So, uh, and you can base that on John's birth because Yeshua and John, they're six months apart. So, uh, John was born actually around Passover. Right. So, so there's an interesting dynamic between Yeshua's life and John's life. Mm -hmm. but, but when Yahweh introduced these feasts, especially Passover, which is the first one, he said, okay, now this is a new beginning for you. That's what he told the Israelites. The Israelites, they were on their own calendar that began during Rosh Hashanah, which is September, October, and God, he totally annihilated that calendar from an ecclesiastical standpoint. He said, spiritually, this is going to be a new day for you. And they accepted that because who doesn't want... God to begin something fresh in the middle of something that's terrible. Yes. You know, we all want that. Could you imagine if you're going through the coronavirus and all these other things that are happening in 2021, and God just jumps up one day and he says, listen, I don't care what the world says, this is the beginning of something new for you. Uh, everybody here, they'd be excited. I would be excited. You know, and so this is exactly what he did to the Israelites. He said, this is something new for you because I'm about to do some things for you in your life, I'm, a, I'm about to end the bondage yes. that you're experiencing in, in Egypt. I'm about to shut down the pride of Pharaoh and his chariots and his horses. And I'm about to take you guys out. But as I take you out, it's going to be so quick that you're going to plunder the nation. And if you continue reading Exodus chapter 12, 13, and 14, you will see that God gave them a play-by-play -play of events that were, that were going to happen in Egypt. He said, this is going to be so confusing for the Egyptians that when you ask them for material, when you ask them for gold, when you ask them for silver, now, now bear in mind now that the Israelites are slaves in Egypt. But he said, it's going to be so confusing that when they let you out of the slavery and you ask them for the gold and you ask them for the silver and you ask them for cattle, he said, whatever you ask them for, they're going to give it to you, and you're going to plunder the nation of Egypt in one night. That's because of the trauma. Yes. Yeah, and, it, yeah, it, and that's what God does. Mm -hmm. And so the feasts that he originated, they are not connected to Israel alone mm -hmm. because it tells a greater story. In 2021, in the 21st century we live right now, this entire planet is Egypt. The entire planet is Egypt. Mm -hmm. So Egypt is no longer a country. Egypt is now a global system. Yes. Yeshua said this in Revelation. He said that uh, when, when I return, everybody who pierced me will see my return. He said, especially those who live in Sodom and Egypt. Now we know that the Romans, the Roman soldiers, they were the ones that pierced Yeshua. Yes. So this had nothing to do with Egypt. But what, what, what Yahweh is saying from his perspective, all of these nations who do not observe my standards, who do not observe the kingdom, they collectively have become Egypt to me. Mm -hmm. And so we're living in a time right now where as, even if you're in the Bahamas or you're in the UK or you're in Canada or you're in America, those countries don't matter. From God's perspective, this is now Egypt. The entire planet is now Egypt. And he has a system where he wants to get the people, his people that are in Egypt, 
to a new place, a promised land, so that they can leave there and worship him. So what he was doing back in Egypt is he was setting a, blue, a blueprint and a standard to show you that when the people begin to press hard upon you, when you face certain trials and tribulations, and he raises up a prophet to declare certain things in the land, you have to come into faith and agreement with that word so that you can exit this land to go into the nation that he's calling you into. And of course, you know that the nation that he's calling us into is this new heavenly nation, it's the kingdom that Yeshua was building. So Yeshua was, the purpose was for us to leave this planet to get to this new promised land, this new paradise, this new garden of Eden that God uh, showed John in Revelation. Mm -hmm. But in order to get there, we have to escape the bondage of, of Egypt, and we also have to partake in the feast that Yahweh declared that we were supposed to observe. Mm -hmm. That's, That's very hard for a lot of people to accept, like I said, because we are so far removed from the things that he did. But here's the awesome thing. The, the 144,000 in Revelation, the Bible says that when the Israelites left Egypt, they sang the song of Moses. When we, as a collective body, leave this planet and move, migrate to heaven, the first thing we sing is the song of Moses and the Lamb. So all along, God was trying to make sure that we understood that this, this template of the Israelites leaving Egypt is not talking about two countries. It's talking about two different kingdoms. One is a spiritual kingdom that belongs to Yahweh. The other one is a spiritual kingdom that is submissive to Satan. One of the things that he said in Exodus chapter 12, I believe it's verse 12, is he said, I will not only punish Pharaoh, he said, I will also punish the gods, the demons that are in the heavenlies above Egypt. So this was spiritual warfare at its highest level. And we're going to experience that moving closer and closer to Yeshua's return. So is Egypt, is, sorry, is Passover still relevant for us to celebrate in 2021? It is. One, because Yeshua has not returned. And two, Egypt is more forceful now than it has ever been. What does Egypt represent spiritually for us who are alive now in 2021? It represents the same thing that Pharaoh represented. It was a country that did not want God's people to worship him in spirit and in truth. And the thing about Egypt uh, that's so striking is Egypt, the Egyptians, they had their own religion. They had their own beliefs. And they had their own special books. So Yeshua, when he died, and he went to heaven. The Bible says that in Revelation chapter 4 and chapter 5, there was a court case. Mm -hmm. And this mighty angel, he called out who is worthy to take the Lamb's Book of Life and open it. Open the scroll. Break the seals. And we know that Yeshua was the one who took the Lamb's Book of Life. What, what qualified him to take the Lamb's Book of Life? He was the Lamb slain. So it has everything to do with Passover, because Passover always pointed to Yeshua being the lamb slain so that he could get the book. Well, the Egyptians did not want the Israelites to celebrate this feast, because the Egyptians had their own book. It's not a book of life, it's the book of the dead. And this was the book that gave them great power. So what happens on, on, in Yahweh's kingdom is when you celebrate life, and when, and when you celebrate progress, and when you celebrate and worship, you're actually supposed to gain eternal life. So you celebrate life so that you can get eternal life. Well, the Egyptians, they were on the flip side. They celebrated death so that they can get life. And that's why the Book of the Dead was so important to them. And so how do you appease Egyptian gods when there's rain and there's fire and all, the, all these things are happening to the Egyptians? What do they do? They would take the babies of the Israelites and they would throw them into the river yes. so that the babies could be consumed. Mm -hmm. They offer blood sacrifices to their gods so that they could escape death. Mm -hmm. And so Yahweh said, okay, here's what I'm going to do. Since they will not let my people go, I'm going to show them just how serious I am about worship by allowing their firstborn sons to die. He said, it's not just human beings, it's the cattle, it's everything. So we're now, in 2021, we're at a point where we're coming to this, this crossroads where 
You, you can, can have, actually have to choose between worshiping God in fullness and in truth, or submitting to the doctrines and the theology of the Egyptians. So when the mainstream church, when they took Passover, they said, okay, we understand the sacrifice. We understand what Yeshua did. We're talking about, you know, this is 1,500 years ago, mm -hmm. back in the, the time of the Romans, 355 AD, when they officially adopted Christianity as their religion. When they took Passover as uh, their first feast of the year, Passover is the first feast, that, you know, because you always say this is the beginning of the year, so that's the first feast of the year. When they took it, they actually married Passover with another pagan holiday, uh, it's called Iestra. Mm -hmm. That's what the Germans call it, you know, and then the, the Germans, they gave it to the British, and then the British uh, took the name Iestra and they turned it into Easter. It was a pagan holiday that actually celebrated fruitfulness. Fruitfulness because you're coming out of winter when everything is dead, yes. and then you're moving into a new time when everything comes back to life. Okay, everything is blooming. Well, Yahweh had the same mindset when he allowed Yeshua to die during Passover because that's when everything was supposed to die. We all collectively were supposed to die. That was, that was the stakes that Yahweh set. We all were supposed to die. And so he gives us Passover so that instead of us dying, there's one lamb, one person that dies so that we can all live. And so that's, that's really why Passover is still relevant in 2021. Because like I said, Yeshua has not returned yet. Passover was not only given to the Israelites. It was given to them first, as Paul said. Everything was given to them first. And then the broader spectrum were the Gentiles. Yeah, so because even when he, when he put them in the land of Egypt, in the land of Canaan, yeah. he moved them there so that they could teach the nations around them right. the things that he taught them right. in the wilderness. Yeah. So then he eventually convert the entire world exactly. to go according to the standards that exactly. he committed. So it was, yeah, it was all about global conversion. Yes. You know, Yahweh never wanted one isolated set of people on the planet to be his. He, t he told Abraham, listen, I'm going to make you and your generations a gateway to all the nations. A gateway to all the nations. And so all the nations, they started building these arches, and they would call these arches gateways to the nations. So you look at all the ancient kingdoms, the Hittites, the Jebusites, the Perizzites, all of these nations, if you go and you research their territories and their dominions, their entrance gate was always called the gate to the nations. Right. Even down to us in 2021, the United Nations, mm -hmm. they're called the gate, the gateway to the nations. And so the concepts that God has authored in Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, you know, the, the, the Torah, the first five books, we are still experiencing them today. They don't want you to believe that those concepts are still relevant. But everything that's happening right now is going according to the blueprint that was set way back then. So, so we give God praise for allowing us to see the blueprint of what the enemy is doing so that we can counteract that with God's word. So yes, Passover is still relevant today. There's some interesting things about Passover that a lot of people don't know. For instance, as Anik was reading in the scripture, Passover, you were supposed to take the lamb, you were supposed to bring this lamb into your household. It was almost as if you had adopted this lamb as a pet. Yes. It was supposed to be, you know, a firstborn lamb without squat or blemish. It had a certain age bracket that it was supposed to be in. You were supposed to wash it. You were supposed to keep it clean. Fatten it. They call it fattening the lamb. Fatten it for six days. And then during Passover, you would slaughter the lamb. And then you would eat the lamb whole. So the first time they did it, he said, I want you to eat this lamb whole. Yeah. He said, I don't want you to boil it. <laughs> it's funny because it's almost like how Bahamians do with crafts. Yeah. They take a cage, them, feed them, feed them. take care of them so they can fatten them up. That's the right. Fatten them up for the slaughter. <laughs> yeah. And so that's what they did. It was like you added this person to your home, this lamb, and became a part of your home. And, and you know, children, they were attached to it. And they're like, y'all be supposed to kill this? This is not my pet. And, you know, the parents had to explain to them, yes. Although you love it, although you appreciate it, it has to die because this means something to Yahweh. Yeah. And so when he sent his son as the Passover lamb, if you look at the life of Yeshua, six days before he goes to the cross, he is actually brought to the home to have a feast, um, and he is celebrating the recovery of Lazarus. Mm -hmm. Lazarus has just been brought back to life. 
and he's going to go home with Mary Martha. They're having a celebration, and during the celebration, six days before Passover, Yeshua is washed. His entire body is washed. And this washing is just like what the Lamb experienced in the Old Testament with Moses. So he followed everything to a T, except one thing. Except one thing. Yeshua actually did not eat the Passover meal that year that he died. Because he called the Lord's Supper, you know, we call it the Last Supper, right? We call it the Last Supper, and we call it the Passover Supper. Mm -hmm. But actually, this happened two days before Passover uh, was marked on the calendar, mm -hmm. the meeting that he had with the disciples. The whole time that they're up in the upper room and they're washing uh, yeah, she's washing their feet, and you know, Judas is there, and they're talking about the betrayal. This does not happen on Passover day. This happens two, two days before Passover. Mm -hmm. And Yeshua, in that moment, he institutes communion, what we call communion now. And by the way, we're going to do communion this evening as well. So I, I, I pray that you guys have some wafers or some crackers or some juice that you can use uh, because after this, I'm hoping that this, the, the relevance of Passover really means something to you in 2021. Because it's a powerful feast. It's a feast that unlocks the next 12 months for you and we want Yahweh to position you to receive everything that he has for you. Yes. But Yeshua, two days before Passover, they gather in the upper room and it's a prophetic meeting because even getting to the meeting is a prophetic, it's a prophetic journey. They ask Yeshua, where are we gonna have the Passover feast? And he says, okay, uh, when, when you go, go to the town, there's going to be somebody that's going to be carrying water pot, and you follow them to, to this upper chamber, and you ask the person of the, the, the house, you know, they're going to ask you, what are you doing here? And you say, okay, we're looking for the place where we're supposed to celebrate the Passover. And he said, and then they're going to show you where to prepare the room. And everything happened just as Yeshua said. And so they get to this meeting that is two days before the official Passover meal, and it's told to them that Yeshua is going to be betrayed and he's, he's going to die. Yes. And he, he talked, talked to them a lot about this, about this journey of him being betrayed and him, him dying. And, and for those of you who never heard the scripture in earnest, you, we're talking about uh, the, the title for this segment is Blood Pressure, pressure right? You, you're, you're talking about the Lamb of God whose purpose from, from day one was to die in case we sin. sin. So, so the question was asked, by the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, if we create this planet with these people, and then these people sin, how are we going to redeem them? And Yeshua decided that if that's the case, we create Adam and Eve and their descendants, and they enter into sin, then I would be the one who would go and die so that they can be redeemed, so that they can be forgiven. And so the whole setup for Yeshua's atonement for Yeshua's death and his resurrection, it was all built in the fact that if we sinned, we would have a redeemer. Yes. And it was easy to say that in the spiritual realm. Yes. You know, it's easy, it's like us, you know, when we, when we say, okay, man, I see somebody do that, you know, that's easy for them to do, or, or I can do the same thing, you know, we've all had that arrogance about us, right? Yes. You, you see somebody that 50 pounds in the gym, you're like, man, I can lift that with my eyes closed, you know, or you, you see somebody running a marathon, you're like, you know, give me two weeks and I can get in shape and I can do that, you know, we, we, we have that kind of arrogance when we see something, but don't know the dedication that it takes to get to that level. Well, Yeshua had that same kind of mindset in a spiritual sense. We said, okay, you know what? This is going to be an easy thing. You know, I'm going to be connected to the Father. So if that happens, I'll take on human flesh and I will die for them. But when it came time for him to actually experience it from a humanistic standpoint, he understood that this was a lot of pressure. And we should be very grateful that we have somebody who understands the pressure that we're under. Because, you know, don't take it for granted that the Father has not experienced the human walk. The Holy Spirit has not experienced the human walk. But we have Yeshua as our advocate, and he has experienced this human walk. He's been tempted in all ways, the Bible says. And he has overcome every temptation. Yes. But he doesn't just say to us, oh, well, you know what, I did it, so I expect all of you to do it as well. He goes to the Father on our behalf and he says, you know what, uh, Father, this situation that they're going through right now, 
it may seem simple from the supernatural standpoint, but I can tell you from experience, being a human, what they're going through is very, very difficult. So I need you to have a little bit more compassion on them for this segment of the journey. And we, we, you know, I'm grateful to Yeshua every single day yeah. that he has that kind of communication yeah. with the Father on our behalf. Because that's what it means to be a true advocate. That's what it means. Yeah. You put yourself in that position. You've been there. You've, been there. You've done that. Mm -hmm. And you, you understand it. Mm -hmm. you know, so it's the difference between sympathy and empathy. You, you understand it because you've been in those shoes. Mm -hmm. But, but my question to you, uh, my, my next question is going to come after we read this, because, you know, yes, we talked talk about the pressure of the journey a lot. Uh, and I'm going to ask uh, Brother Corey if you can read this next scripture for us, please. I'm just going to fill in for him right sure. now. He, he just needs one more minute. <laughs> okay, okay, sure. That's, that's no problem. problem. Luke 12, 49 through 56. I came to set, bring, cast fire to the world, and I wish it were already burning or kindled. I have a baptism, metaphor for suffering, portraying as an overwhelming deluge, to suffer through, to be baptized with, and I feel very troubled, distressed until it is over. Do you think I came to give peace to the earth? No, I tell you, I came to divide it or to bring division. For from now on, a family or a house with five people will be divided, three against two, and two against three. They will be divided, father against son, and son against father, mother against daughter, and daughter against mother, mother-in-law against daughter-in-law, and daughter-in-law against mother-in-law. Then Jesus said to the people, or the crowds, when you see clouds coming in, coming up in the west, immediately you say, it's going to rain, and so thus it happens. When you feel the wind begin to blow from the south, the desert, you say it will be a hot day and it happens. Hypocrites, you know how to understand or interpret the appearance of the earth and sky. Why don't you understand or know how to interpret what is happening now, this present time, the time of the coming of the kingdom? This is the word of the hour. Amen. 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 Powerful word. So in that scripture, that was Luke chapter 12, verses 49 through 56. In this particular scripture, we get an up close personal view of what Yeshua was experiencing during his final days on the planet. We get an understanding of his psyche at that moment. And he's saying that there's something that's coming, and I wish it had happened already because this is this is some great pressure. You guys don't understand the, the intense amount of pressure that I'm under. This moment, it took 4,000 years to get from Adam to Yeshua. And Yeshua only had 33 years on the planet. And now he's coming to the end of the journey. But as he's coming to the end, he recognizes that there's so much work that was supposed to be done that even he, as the son of God, could not do. So many healings that were supposed to take place, but when he went to certain towns, the people's faith, they were not ready. So many things that were supposed to happen, and Yeshua was saying to himself, I, 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 I am weary of the journey because I'm now approaching the end, mm -hmm. and it doesn't feel good. So he calls this a baptism, a baptism. That's what he calls this moment that he's entering into. And he knows that it's going to happen around Passover, so he's very cautious of the timing. And in fact, if you read his account in John, John says that people are actually asked him. They said, uh, Yeshua, yeah, sure, you're going to go to Jerusalem and now show yourself as the Messiah in Jerusalem. So you have this great, this grand ceremony coming into Jerusalem as king. And Yeshua said to them, no, I'm not going. And then the Bible says, but then he secretly went. Yes. And so the question is, what, did Yeshua lie? You know, did he lie about it? But he answered that question, truthfully. They asked him, not if he's going to celebrate Passover. Of course, every Israelite is going to celebrate Passover. They asked if you're going to publicly announce during this Passover feast that you are the Messiah. And he said, no, that's not, that's not the job. But at the same time, he knew that this was the Passover that he was going to die to become the Passover lamb. And so he's saying, I have this pressure that's on me now because my blood is the only blood that can purify this entire world. So I don't want to die 
but I have to die. My work is not finished yet, but I have to trust that when I leave, the disciples are going to be led by the Holy Spirit to finish all the work that I was supposed to do. And so he's in a conundrum because he wants to finish the work, but he cannot finish the work. Uh, and, and I want you to know expressly that when he talks about dividing, you notice he said I'm dividing father and son and, and mother and daughter, mother-in-law and daughter-in-law, father-in-law and, and son-in-law, right? He's talking about all these divisions. You notice that Yeshua never in the Bible divides husband and wife. Never. Never divides husband and wife. The reason is from his perspective, the hour's perspective, when you become one flesh, you can no longer be divided. It's impossible. So there are a lot of parameters that have to be met if you're living with an unsaved spouse. And you need that spouse saved. Or you need that spouse to operate with the kingdom mindset that you know Yahweh is calling your family to. There are a lot of things that have to go into making sure these things are set. You know, and it's very difficult. I understand the pain, you know, of being in a position where you want somebody who you're bonded to or connected to, and there's an imprint between you spiritually and physically. You want both of these persons to be uh, lights in the kingdom, you know. And so Yeshua never divides that because to divide husband and wife when they're already one is to actually divide the Trinity. Mm -hmm. Because we were made in their image, and then they brought the two together. So now it's like they're now operating like the Trinity from a humanistic standpoint. So to unravel that relationship is actually to unravel the relationship between Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And they can never be unraveled, that relationship, that dynamic between them. Right, uh, only through death from a physical standpoint. Right, only through death from a physical standpoint. Uh, uh, but from, from a... Yes. You're here, I'm here. That's yes. right. Yeah, it, it, it just doesn't happen. Mm -hmm. You know, and Yeshua spent a lot. In fact, <laughs> the disciples, when he told them, you know, he, he doesn't condone a divorce, uh, and there's only one, one reason why you get a divorce. The disciples, they, they joked. They said, well, I think it's better that you don't get married if that's the case, you know, because they were getting divorced for anything uh, under, under the law of Moses, uh, the supposed law of Moses. Uh, certificates of divorce, and, and I always said, no, that's not supposed to, to be the case. But here's my next question for you scholars. Uh, we talked a lot now. I'm hoping that we got some answers here. We want some, we want some content now, some response from those of you who are on. Uh, so so yes, we'll talk about this baptism of fire, right? So I want to know, what comes first? According to Yeshua, is it the world burning or Yeshua's baptism of suffering? All right, so you got two events that happens. And you actually put both of them together in this Luke 12 dynamic. He said that uh, something comes first and then something comes next. I want to know from your standpoint, and you can explain and elaborate you know, why you feel it's that way. But what comes first? Is it the world burning or is it Yeshua's baptism of suffering? When you say the world's burning, yes, give me some um, more clarity as to what you're referring to. Okay, so let's actually, uh, Anika, if you have that scripture, I want, I want you to read just that verse where he's talking about this specifically in Luke chapter 12. I believe yes. it's oh, yes. okay, okay, Corey, yes, hey, Corey. Corey. yes. Uh, verse 49, verse 49, yes, it says, I came to set or bring a cast fire to the world and I wish it were already burning, kindled in the, um, yeah. in this, yeah. Yes. So Yeshua, out of his own mouth, he said, I came to set fire to the world and I wish that it were already burning. If that's the case then, uh, Yeshua, Yeshua came before the fire. Okay. I, 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 like, yeah, I agree with, with BJ. Um, I believe he suffered before the fire came because his suffering was for him to go to the cross. And I believe that fire has to do with the end time and the lake of fire um, as a document in Revelation. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that's what I, I see. That okay. is me. So, so, so you, you say, say the, the, the fire, fire comes, comes first. The suffering comes first. 
the actual, the actual suffering, suffering comes first. Yes, the suffering. And I, I, I see the suffering as him going to the cross, yes. okay. bearing our sins, dying, resurrecting mm -hmm. uh, with all power. Okay. And then with that power, he's able to uh, judge the world mm -hmm. by bringing fire, which um, gives way to the lake of fire in the end time. Okay. And, and, that's, and if you don't mind me interjecting here, my, my interject here, Yes. Yes. Just read who was who was doing the talking there? Christ, right? Yes. yes. Was Christ doing the talking in that church text? Yes, yes sir. sir. Luke, Luke 12. 12. So it seems like <laughs> it goes back to his, it goes back to his time in the Garden of uh, Gethsemane when he said, Lord, if there be any way you can just take this cup from me, uh, let it be, but not my will, but thy will be done. So mm. We see the we see the uh, the humanness of Christ in that scripture when he said he wished that the world would burn first before he had to go through what he did. <laughs> he realized that was not that was not in the master's that was not in his father's plan. Right. So those two scriptures, those two two events, kind of like uh, kind of like collaborate what we're getting at here, that mm -hmm. Christ had to suffer before judgment came to the world because right. he was he was given us again he was given us a sense that he was also the scapegoat. And we yes. know from history that uh, the, 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 each, uh, the Israelite at a certain time of the year put all their sins symbolically on the scapegoat and it was let out to just perish out there. And Jesus Christ was in essence the scapegoat. So he had to go through the suffering and then God would now have just God would then be able to justify his actions when it coming to destroying the world. He's given us a chance right now, but unfortunately, God was not accepting this chance. So that's my little take on it. Thank you, guys. Ah, uh, yes, that wonderful, wonderful. wonderful. Anybody, Anybody else? else? That was a beautiful. Anyone else? Uh, want he's to take he's that showing the Bronx. He's showing he's a fair and he's a just God. And he's showing us that even though Yeshua was slain from the foundation of the world, he had to come in human form to show his love to us and to justify us that through the blood of Yeshua, we can all be saved. So that when we stand before him as the ultimate judge, we have no excuses to say, you didn't give us a chance. It's not fair for the lake of fire. So Yeshua, Yeshua had to go through what he went through to justify that when we stand before him as the ultimate judge, like I said, we have no excuse. He shared his blood, not only for the Jews, but he shared his blood for the whole entire world. But Yahweh is a faithful, He's a loving, he is a compassionate, he's a fair God. And so we have a right right now to choose. Will, we serve? will it be the gods on the other side or will it be Yeshua or Yahweh? So he's a fair and he's a just God and we praise him. Amen, amen. Amen. Uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna jump in on this one here too, <laughs> and uh, I agree pretty much with everybody. But I think uh, I'm gonna take the, the high road. <laughs> I, be I believe that uh, the burning comes first before the suffering. Why do I say the burning comes first before the suffering? Because in the garden, the judgment was set. They say you shall surely die. So that means the world was already burning. Everything was burning. So everything, the judgment was already set. So the suffering came in to be able to redeem the burning. So I take the high road and I said the burning comes first <laughs> because the judgment was already set. Because of course we, we know that the way Yahweh operates, he does the what was it? He begins the end from the beginning. So he already saw the ending. So the world was burning. So the end the, the once the scene was there, that said the world was burning already. So Yeshua now came in as the atonement, which was the first uh, the land that was slain from the foundation just to make that atonement. So I believe that the world was already burning first before the insurance policy kicked in. But of course the insurance policy had to kick in anyway before that because we know that in case <laughs> they sin, how can we redeem them? 
So they knew that the word, they knew that it was sin automatically. So they see the word burning and then they, they ensure the suffering and the, the insurance policy. So I'll go there. I'll take the high road. Sorry, scholars, but the word, uh, the word burning first, then the suffering. He, he's an outlier. You're an outlier. He's an outlier. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> You're way over there. He's way over there. Uh, you know, my, my perception of it is it's twofold. So Yeshua is speaking, and he's speaking, it's a dual language that Yeshua is operating under. So he's not only speaking from his personal perspective as a human being and as a lamb, but then he's also speaking as Yahweh. Because he's Yahweh's voice. So when, when you had in Egypt, when you had Pharaoh as the antagonist, right? And then you had Aaron and Moses. Aaron was the high priest. Moses was the voice of God, right? So Aaron became the prophet. Moses became God's mouthpiece. Mm -hmm. And so God never spoke to Pharaoh. God spoke to Moses, and Moses spoke to everybody, the Israelites and the Egyptians and Pharaoh, right? So Yeshua, at this point, he is God's representative. He is God's voice on the planet. But then he's also the lamb who is about to go through the suffering. I believe the confusion, this was very confusing to the disciples. They didn't understand Yeshua's logic because when he first sent them out, he said to them, and I want you to go out and I want you to evangelize all of these people and I want you to evangelize all of these towns. He said, and if they don't accept you, then I want you to... That's the sandals of your feet. It means that you are discarding them from entering into the spiritual time frame that I have presented to evangelize the planet, to heal the sick, to raise dead, all the great things that I want to do in these communities. They will now be expelled from having that experience. They, they're cut off from that. And so they get so wrapped up into this idea of, okay, we're now partakers in this moment that they go and they, they jump, jump the gun. gun. Uh, when they're supposed to go into Samaria, right? Yeah, yeah, okay. The people reject them. Mm -hmm. So they're like, okay, well, this is the end for them because they cannot enjoy and partake in this moment. So how about we call down fire from heaven? And Yeshua says, now you've gone too far. We're not at that stage yet. I need you to pump the brakes on that because this is not time for the fire yet. And, and so, you know, I agree with both of you. <laughs> if Joe is an outlier and you guys are on this side and I'm in the middle, you know, because from, 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 from Yahweh's standpoint, because Yahweh's outside of time, Yahweh already sees the world burning. So I agree completely. Yahweh already sees this whole thing wrapping up. But from Yeshua's humanistic perspective, we haven't gotten to the burning yet. This is still time for them to be saved. So he's taking it slowly. And, and he wants them to, you know, he, he, he expresses that from Yahweh's standpoint, I wish that this already happened. Because okay. I see it burning too, Father. And I see the destruction happening because these people are wicked. They're adulterous. They, they, they commit abominations every single day of the week, which is kind of where we are right now in 2021. Uh, you know, we came through one of the worst pandemics of the 21st century, and for three months, you had everybody, you know, gathered around Zoom. They don't want to hear what God is saying because, you know, they don't want to be destroyed. They want their families to be protected. They don't know if the world is going to uh, be destroyed in 2020, you know. And so you, you have this hunger and a passion and a desire because they now saw the plagues of Egypt active. And they're like, okay, boy, it's time for us to really... Uh, get it together because from, from what they're, they're saying around the world, we're going to experience a 10, 15, maybe even a 20 percent uh, depletion of our population. Mm -hmm. You know, so, so you're talking, talking about 20 to 30 percent of people dying from plague. Everybody's scared because this is like the, one of the worst things that can happen. And then as they start to roll out vaccines and start to give this hope, then everybody starts to relax spiritually. They're like, okay, well, the world really isn't burning as we thought it would. So now you have some time to play. You have some time to play. And, you know, and unfortunately, we, we take for granted that Yeshua is the one who is making sure that we don't have these experiences yet. And the Holy Spirit really is, it, you know, the, the Bible says that in Revelation, you have the, the winds from the four corners of the earth being withheld so that the damage does not come to the planet. 
Uh, but let's also look at, look at this from a global warming standpoint. standpoint. Let's, let's look at the hierarchy of global warming. So uh, uh, those of you who, who have heard or have done some research on global warming, uh, let me just see you put a reaction, raise your hand. If you've done some research on global warming, uh, you believe that it's an issue. If you believe that, if you've done some research, put your hand up. Uh, the reaction. If, if you've done the research and you believe that it's a great issue, then in the reaction button, just uh, do your thumbs. Show me your thumbs. So if you've done the research but you don't feel like it's an issue, just put the hand up. Say, I've done the research, I've heard about it, but I don't really believe it's an issue. Then you can put your hand up. Uh, if you've done the research and you're convinced that this is a major issue, then let me see thumbs in the reaction, in the reaction area. <laughs> All right, so let's see. So we've got Dr. Leonard. He's saying he's done the research. He doesn't believe. BJ said he's done the research. Doesn't believe. Chad, he said, hey, Chad, what's up, brother? Chad said he's done the research and he believes it's an issue. Uh, and I haven't seen anybody else really respond. So I guess they're waiting for, for Joe's interpretation before they make a decision. <laughs> so let's look at global warming from a biblical standpoint. Uh, let's see what's happening, really, from a biblical standpoint. When the planet was created, the planet was created like a, and I don't want to, uh, I don't want to invoke the wrath of the flat earthers, right? <laughs> but the planet was created, and it was encased within a dome of water. That's what Genesis tells us, right? It tells us that the planet was encased in this dome of water, and called by calls it a firmament. So they had three levels of water. You had the firmament that was encased in the planet, and then you had the water that was actually on the planet, oceans, seas, rivers, lakes, those kinds of things. We know that they had rivers and lakes in Eden. Mm -hmm. You know, the Bible speaks about that. And then you had this third level of water that was beneath the planet. Mm -hmm. So you have three levels of water. You have the encasement of the water, the domes, the firmament that was like a, a bubble that wrapped the planet. And then you got the waters on the planet, and then you got the waters in the deep. Now, the Bible tells us that, and you know, science also tells us that when you are encapsulated in water, it produces a very healthy level of oxygen. So once we have the firmament, human beings are taller. Animals can be a little longer. Human beings can live longer. We can be uh, larger, which means... You know, you have the, you can make the case for large animals being on the planet when the firmament is there. Right. The Bible said that during the flood, it says that the waters from the firmament fell to the planet, and it says that the waters from the deep rose up. So you have the waters converging from the top, and you have the waters rising up from the bottom, and now it creates this globe that's just water. There's no more firmament. You just have water across the entire planet. After the flood, the Bible says that the waters began to recede. The Bible never says that the waters went back to the firmament. The waters left. So now you have the, the, the planet is exposed to these harmful rays from outer space. Okay, the space that we have outside, right? The Bible says that the waters went back down, but the Bible never says that the waters returned to the deep. So now what you have is, we know that the inside of the planet is a core, right? There's a core, and science told us that the inside of the planet is hot. If you had heat and water at the inside of the planet, which is the deep, right? If you had heat and water, then you would have an equilibrium of temperature. That temperature would make sure that the crust of the planet is cool, and then you have the firmament that makes sure that the atmosphere is cool, and you're also protected from harmful rays. When you lose that firmament that's around the planet, and when you lose the water that's in the deep, what you have is heat coming from the outside, and you have heat coming from below. So we're now in a sandwich on the crust of the planet. And everybody is saying there's heat that's coming down on us from the atmosphere, and then, but we neglect the heat that's coming from below. Because if the waters don't go back to the deep, then that means that heat is going to rise, and the heat index is going to keep rising until the planet is off balance. Now what happens when that heat rises to the point where it's close to the crust? All of the ice caps that are connected to the crust will begin to melt. So it's not so much the damage from the ozone 
the, the atmosphere, atmosphere that's, that's outside. outside. It's, it's the, the damage, damage from beneath that's, that's really doing, doing the damage. damage. Most people don't want to credit that as the problem because then that actually lends credibility to the biblical narrative of what happened during the flood. Yes. And so we are in the experience because now the atmosphere is getting really, really hot. Yeshua is on his way back. And the Bible tells us that the size of New Jerusalem, it says the New Jerusalem is coming to the meet planet Earth, right? It tells us that the New Jerusalem is about as one-sixth the size of the planet. So you have this huge collision that's about to take place. And whenever something migrates at that level from outside of our sphere and comes into the atmosphere, it creates heat. All of you have seen a rocket return to the atmosphere, right? You've seen the heat that comes uh, with that rocket reestablishing connection with our atmosphere, right? The rocket burns up. They have to have protective gear and insulation within the, the rocket to protect the astronauts uh, when they're coming back into the atmosphere, right? So imagine that collision of something that's so big coming and impacting it. It's coming with its own heat. And so what we're going to experience as Yeshua returns, it's going to get harder because his arrival is close. And it's going to get harder on the planet because we, we are constantly losing that water, that temperature. The core temperature is rising as the water begins to recede because the planet now is out of balance. There's no equilibrium. And once the Holy Spirit, as Revelation says, starts holding back the winds, then we're really going to be in trouble. So global warming is something that cannot be corrected by human beings. It can't be corrected. I don't care what they try to do. It, it, it can't be corrected because we've lost too much from a spiritual standpoint. We've lost too much from a scientific standpoint. And those are things that can only be regained through Yahweh instituting that. And so if Yahweh does not rebuild the permanent, which the Bible says he will do, then we're going to be at a loss. If Yahweh does not cool the temperature of the planet, which the Bible never says he will, then we're going to be at a loss. And so... Our only hope, I'm telling you this because I want you to know, our only hope of escape from this planet is Yeshua. That's the only hope. And so when he talks about this fire that he wished the world would experience now, he's talking about all these things because Yeshua is about to die and when you're about to die, you know, you start to see everything. They say the life flashes before you, before your eyes, right? That's one of the things that common people say. Well, Yeshua's entire life, his entire uh, the scope of what he came to do, as well as what he's going to do when he comes back. Because he told the disciples all of it. You know? He told them in plain language, this is what's going to happen, this is what, what's going to happen when I return. He gave them the entire blueprint. And so at this point of dying, he is seeing himself return. And he knows that it's going to be catastrophic for the planet. Uh, but, you know, he, he, he kind of eliminates that whole vision of revelation and he sets that apart for John to experience when he comes back uh, in 95 AD. But at that moment, 33 AD, when he's talking about this fire that's about to happen, he's talking about the pressure of his sacrifice. And he's letting people know, listen, this is going to be hard for me, but I have to do it so that you're protected. But now that I've done it, my hands are clean. If you don't accept the sacrifice, if you don't do what I've asked you to do and follow the things that I've put in place, follow the protocols and procedures, then you're going to end up in lots of trouble. Mm -hmm. So I just thank God for, for, for that. So um, anybody, anybody have any questions, any comments? Yes, I want to add a, a comment to that uh, global warming that you mentioned. And uh, that's exactly what uh, the Bible tells us clearly on that, on that global warming. It says that uh, the earth is groaning when it's yes. the manifestation of the sons of men. And you talk yeah. about how the crust is already hot. Look at what mankind has done. We know all the precious metal comes from the earth. Yes. The diamond, the gold, the iron, I mean, metal. Look at metal. I mean, even if not for gold and diamond, they have ripped the earth from his metal. Mm -hmm. Just for metal, <clears throat> before they even went after gold and diamond. So for that, for, for all that they have done, they, uh, the, the crust is no longer the same. Uh, you talk about uh, uh, um, the plates. You know, mm -hmm. as, as, as we learn in, in geology, they talk about the plates, the, the plates that, that keep the earth in, 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 in its right position. All yeah. these plates are shifting around. Yes. So with that now, 
you know, we see exactly what, what, what the Bible tells us, how the earth is groaning, waiting for the manifestation of the Son of Man. So, yes, as you mentioned that we, as believers, you know, we have an agenda also to make sure that uh, we take our rightful position because, like you said, global woman, mankind cannot help it, and it's over. But the earth is waiting for the sons of men to take their rightful position. Yes. I believe that's where we, we are in now until Yeshua returns. That's my comment. Amen. 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 Yeah. yeah, yeah, definitely. I mean, you can see even uh, reiterating on that too, how um, so many are trying to just get out, you know, the, the escape into space. You see how so many programs they've got with uh, <laughs> space programs and things like that and all that stuff. And so they know something is going up, you know, with, um, so, yeah, with so many, you know, so they know that you know the end is near. For yeah, sure. so they are they're aware of that fully. Yes. Oh yeah, yeah. yeah. They, they they know because, because the Bible, Bible calls Paul called them the sons of Belial. You know, and and, and so, so the, the sons of Belial, there it's, it's a really euphemism for the sons of Satan. Yes, uh, they are the ones who who study technology and who study the sciences. And, you know, they were very instrumental in taking God out of sciences because the sciences were actually instituted by men of God. And over the last 200 years, they've actually stripped the house of God with the sciences and the physics and astronomy and all those things, and they, they have given them to mankind. But God is calling people, as you said, Joe, who will stand up for him, the sons of God, who will be his representatives and actually bring holiness back to all these offices. Yes. You know, and so if God can get a group of his people to actually come together in agreement and say, you know what, I don't care what science says, we're going to we're going to uh, destroy this concept of global warming and actually reduce the core temperature of the planet. If God's people will get together and actually come united and ask God to do these things, it will happen. The problem is God's people are so disjointed. You know, and, you know, case in point, as I said earlier, you, you, we're confused because this week we're celebrating Passover and the next week we're celebrating Easter, you know, and then in May, the Orthodox, the Eastern Orthodox Church, they're celebrating Easter in May. So you have three different Passovers happening in 2021. And, and God is confused as to what has happened to his people, you know, and so we cannot get united for the simplest things that God instituted said will be, you know, here forever. So if we can't be united on the simplest things, can you imagine trying to tackle something as large as global warming or, you know, uh, the, the whole Egyptian slavery mindset? It doesn't happen. Yet, in Satan's kingdom, they are completely aligned. They're not divided. So people talk about Satan's kingdom being weak and you know, you just come in and you take back what the devil stole. It's not simple because Satan and his kingdom, they are not divided. They understand one thing. The planet is about to die and God is about to judge. And so we've got to escape the planet. And that's their one goal. You know, and so we, we've seen so many things happen in 2019 and in 2020 and 2021. Uh, you've seen huge amounts of CEOs from tech companies and other companies in 2019, they call it the mass exodus. Listen to the, the terms that the world is using. They call it the mass exodus. We had about 59 CEOs in the top companies around the world, right? Uh, just this year, 2021, you know, it's been a fabulous year for Jeff Bezos, and Jeff Bezos, he's talking about stepping down as the CEO of Amazon, one of the wealthiest companies in the world. You know, when the pandemic hit, uh, their, their, their profits went through the roof in 2020. You know, they, they, they were, their business model was already groomed for something like this, to where everything moves and migrates to online, shopping and online buying. I mean, they were just ready to go. And so you had the big, the big companies, the big three. Uh, you had Zoom who was ready, you had Amazon who was ready, and you had Walmart who were ready. And they made a killing, you know, because they had the foresight. But now in 2021, you know, Jeff Bezos is stepping down. And I can tell you, it has everything to do, because like I said, you have to understand certain principles. We, as a people, we don't understand covenant the way that the world understands it, right? Because the world, they're trying to remain in Yahweh's good graces. 
Satan is trying to remain in Yahweh's good graces. We have this perception, the church has taught us this perception, you know, that Satan is against God, and so he's doing his best to overthrow God, and, you know, if God is saying yes, then he's saying no. That's absolutely not what Satan is trying to do. Satan is trying to remain in God's good graces. You get that sense from 2 Kings, 1 Kings, sorry, chapter 22, when God is in his meeting and he's asking who's going to go and be a lying spirit to Ahab. Mm-hmm. And Satan is saying, hey, listen, I will do it for you. Mm-hmm. You don't have to. Don't ask any angels. Don't ask your son. Don't ask the Holy Spirit. Me, I'm right here. I will do it for you. Because he wants to remain in Yahweh's good graces. Because he knows that his time is short. Revelation tells us that when he was kicked out of heaven, he was angry with everybody, especially us on the earth. Not Yahweh. He said he was angry with us on the earth because he knew that his time was short. So, so the perception that he is is uh, you know just completely against God is not correct. The Bible doesn't support that. His issue with the Father is he couldn't have his own way. You know, he couldn't have his own way, and so and so what made it worse is that Yeshua came in as someone who was from heaven and that whole you know genealogy of being a part of this heavenly structure and he decides to come and die on behalf of mankind because Satan was like okay well if I get them to sin then I know that God will not punish me because God is going to have to forgive them because he does not want his creation to perish. So that means if I can get them to sin then all of us have to be welcomed back into the family. He didn't, he didn't account, account for Yeshua dying, dying for us. Mm-hmm. And, and Yeshua did not die for him and the demons that, 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 that betrayed Yahweh. Yahweh. Yeah. And so he's, he's trying, trying to figure out how to get back in Yahweh's good graces. And, and if he can sell us out so that he, he can take our place, place, believe he will do it. Yes. He will do it. Because that's, that's what he does. That's what he does. He sets us up so that we can sin against Yahweh. So that he can say, well, Yahweh, you see what they did? You know, you have to exclude them from heaven. And Yahweh was like, no, but my son died for them. So Passover is about us getting out of Egypt and moving to this new land. Now, I have one more question for you. Uh, and I... let, me, let, me, let me add a comment to what you just said about Satan yes, right quick before you move on. Yes, and uh, as, as we, you know, we don't know how strategic Satan is and what you say, you said it well. But you see what Satan was saying in, the, in, the, in their courtroom that uh, mm-hmm. Micaiah saw in Second King. What he was actually telling Yahweh, said, look, I'm gonna save you and I'm gonna save the angels. I'm gonna save you guys from the hardship. You don't have to go out there and tell a lie. You, 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 you are a God of truth. Yes. Let me go out there and do the bad, the bad job for you. Let me go tell a lie for you. So when you have somebody working for you in that magnitude, that's not somebody that is working against you. That's somebody that wanna be on your grace, yes. on, your, on, your, on your good side. Yes. So you know, I just wanted to add that because that's what he was telling Yahweh, he said, no, no, I'm gonna save you from lying. I'm gonna save you for your <laughs> life. Don't no, no, no. Let me go tell the lie. And that's the word that he used. He said, I will be a lying spirit into his prophet. So yes. indeed, you said it well. And Satan, somebody doing that, that kind of magnitude work for you is somebody that actually wants to be on your good side, not your yes. bad side. Not your bad side. I just wanted to add that comment, brother. Amen. Amen. And, and and you, you know, know, and, and to, to add to what, what you're saying, saying that, that that just that's the enabling mindset of the Antichrist. So when we think of the word anti, right, we, we, we think opposite. So you think, you know, a clock is going clockwise, and then it means it's going this way, and anti-clockwise means it's going the opposite direction. But anti in Hebrew doesn't mean against, it means in place of. That's what it means, in place of. That's the Hebrew term for anti. So when we talk about Antichrist, you're not talking about somebody in, uh, who is against Christ. You're actually talking about somebody who is in place of Christ. So Yeshua, when he was talking to the disciples, they, they, I, I, I know they had to be shocked in Matthew 24 because he gave them the same understanding. He said, this guy is going to be so convincing. And, and John talked about it in Revelation 13, chapter 13 as well. But in Matthew 24, Yeshua, from his own mouth, yes. he said that this guy is going to be so convincing that he is, if you were allowed to, to have an extended amount of time on the planet, he's going to deceive even the very elect. Mm-hmm. That's how close to me he's going to be. So he said, he's going to have my name. And that's another thing they can understand. He said, he's going to have my name. He's going to come in the supposed power of my name. And so he said, if you hear 
mention of him in this inner chamber. He said, don't, don't go. Don't go to the inner chamber. Because I'm, I promise you, you go to the inner chamber and you look at this guy and the things that he's doing, and it's going to be identical to what I do, and you won't be able to tell the difference. So he said, if you hear that he's in the inner chamber, do not go. Do not believe it. If you hear that he's out in the wilderness and he's doing these great miracles, do not go out there. Do not believe it. Yep. Don't go. Don't go. Yeah, because yeah, you, you don't you don't have, have that clarity, you don't have that filter that I have from the realm of the spirit. And so we in 2021, we have to be very, very, very peculiar what words we hear and what we listen to. Because a lot of what's being promoted and what's being preached right now is not truth. It's not truth. And so you you, you have to shop your filter, you have to rely on the Holy Spirit to keep you because some of the things that are being said said right now, it sounds so good. It really sounds good. It sounds credible. But when you hold it up to the word, mm -hmm. it just doesn't fit. You know, and if there's something that doesn't fit in any of the chapters of the Bible, if you find something and you, you, you teach a sermon out of Mark or John or 1 Corinthians, but you see a conflict with Exodus or Deuteronomy, that means that is not true. The truth has to be able to pass through the test of every single biblical book of the Bible. Mm -hmm. And if it cannot fit into that context, then it is not truth. And that's one of the difficult things to do. And so that's why we always go back to the Old Testament. You know, even talking about Passover and what we do. We, as a, as a family, we literally get rid of the yeast in our home for, the, for seven days. That's how we celebrate another bread. We celebrate all the feasts. So we, we go through all the packages and we read the packages. It's, it's not hard. It takes you 20 minutes to do it. It's not anything difficult. You know, you don't have to take all the clothes out of your closet. You don't have to take the shoes out of your closet. It's food. You know, you go in the kitchen. You look through the packages. If it has yeast, there's stuff in it that you get rid of that. It's very simple. You know, but what happens is, as, as people, as we progress and we mature, we look at certain things as tasks. It's not something that we welcome. It's not something that we appreciate. And so we have that experience that we look at the feast of Yahweh as chores. Mm -hmm. When it's supposed to be a celebration. Mm -hmm. you know? And so it flies up in the face of Yahweh, who is the one who's authored these celebrations. And, and, and so we're praying that they're for our benefit. benefit yeah. you know? And so what the Jews do, even though some of them don't believe that the Messiah is, is Yeshua, they still celebrate these things. And so Yahweh attaches blessings to be his. And he, he says, if you do these things, then I will bless the land, and I will do this, and I will add to your bosom. And so the, the, the Jews, even to this day, are still some of the wealthiest people on the planet. <coughs> but as I was saying about Jeff Bezos, uh, you know, the, one of the reasons why I believe that he is looking at terminating his running office as CEO, even when Amazon is crushing it from an economic standpoint, is because from a covenant standpoint, he can no longer be trusted. So, so there, there's, there's a group of individuals, and I want you to understand this quite well. There are a group of individuals that have a certain criteria that must be met. They don't care if you're a believer or you're a sinner. They don't care if you, if you believe in Judaism or you're an atheist. There are certain principles that have to be set from a biblical standpoint that when you come into that fold, you have to operate and abide by those principles. And one of them is simply that you do not leave your spouse. So, so we talk about marriage, right? We talk about from heaven's standpoint. They know that when you separate that oneness, that unity, mm -hmm. then you're bringing in rebellion into your business, you're bringing it into your family, and you cannot operate from that standpoint. And so the majority of those who operate in the shadows from a worldly standpoint, they honor marriage. They may cheat on their spouse, but they honor marriage from a covenantal standpoint. And so when he stepped out on his wife, and then left his wife for uh, his sweetheart. You know, his wife took nearly, uh, I can't remember the percentage, 30% or something to come down. I don't remember how much it was. One of the, one of the biggest divorce settlements in history, I think, outside of Paul McCartney's uh, divorce settlement. But the, the shareholders, they lost confidence because when you portray a marriage at that point, as you always said, you're not supposed to cut those ties. So then... The question is, okay, what else, what other covenant will you break? And you can't operate the business when there's no trust. Uh, and so my, my final question before we enter into this time of communion, really rededicating our, our minds and our hearts back to 
uh, what, what the, the Father is saying, as well as celebrating this as the new year for God to do some great things for us in 2021. You know, I expect this to be a shift and a turnaround for God to unleash great blessings, great miracles, prosperity, all of those things yes. for this Passover of 2021. And so we honor these because we know that this calendar is the calendar that God has set, and He has prescribed certain things to happen in fulfillment on this calendar. You know, Yeshua died during Passover. And so, you know, people try to reconcile, well, if he died on Good Friday and they put him in the grave on Friday afternoon, then he was in the grave Saturday, but how did he rise Sunday and that would be three days? It's because people really don't understand from a biblical standpoint what really happened. Yeshua did not die on Passover. He did not die on Good Friday. He died the day before Preparation Day, as John would tell you in John chapter, you read the account from John 12 to John 20. It explains that six days before Passover, when Yeshua came into Bethany, he had the meeting with Lazarus and his sister, and then two days before Passover is when he gathered with his disciples, and they had the, the Last Supper, as they call it, and he explained his, uh, he explained his betrayal. Yes. And then he died that, he, sorry, he went to trial that night. Yes. That next day, he was crucified, and that afternoon, he was hung on the cross, he died, and they buried him that evening. The Bible says in John chapter 18, I believe it is, that they did not want his body to stay on the cross because this was going into preparation day. Now remember, the evening begins the new day for the Jews. So at 6 p.m., preparation day is the day before Passover. What is preparation day? Remember I said you're supposed to bring that lamb into your house and you keep that lamb for six days and you wash it, you feed it, you fatten it up so that you can eat it at the Passover night? Well, preparation day is the day that you actually prepare the lamb for slaughter. It's a 24-hour process. You wash it, you bathe it for the last time, and then you kill it and you cook it so that that evening, Passover evening, you can have and eat the lamb for Passover. So Yeshua had to die on preparation day so that he could be prepared as the lamb. And so you'll see that when they took him off the cross, they went into the tomb and they prepared him with the oils and the spices and all these things so that, you're right, Nicodemus, so that he can, and Joseph was our leader, right? So that he can go in and be the lamb slain from the foundation. So Passover was on Friday evening. Then Yeshua had to die before Thursday evening and be in the tomb to be the Passover lamb. Mm. So now, when you read it from that standpoint, Yeshua was in the tomb Thursday night to Friday, Friday to Saturday, Saturday to Sunday morning. Okay, but the way the Passover fell in that time, Passover was actually a Thursday evening. So Yeshua was, was, was in the tomb from Wednesday. So you have Wednesday to Thursday, which is day one, Thursday to Friday, which is day two, Friday to Saturday, which is day three. That's, that's how Passover fell during that calendar year. And then he rose the Sunday morning. So that falls completely in line with what he said about uh, Jonah being in the belly of the earth for three days. Uh, sorry, in the belly of the earth for three days. He said that he would be in the heart of the earth for three days and then he would resurrect. Now, the thing about Yeshua's death, the blood, it was so potent that when he died, it actually caused resurrection to happen Yes. On the planet, the moment that he died, the Bible said that when he died, it was a great earthquake, and the, the tombs of some of the Israelites were open, and the people saw these who were dead walking around uh, in the land of the living. Yes. In other words, people came back to life. So we're not talking about zombies now. Um, and, you know, for those of you who watch The Walking Dead, if, if you've seen Corey, Corey, Gupta, he, he's a fabulous actor here in, in Atlanta. But we're not talking about The Walking Dead. We're talking about literally people coming back to life mm -hmm. and being rejuvenated, revived. And, of course, they died again. Mm -hmm. uh, but that's just how powerful the moment was. Uh, my final question to you is this. What do you think, and I want you to hyper, uh, hypothesize, what do you think would have happened if Judas did not betray Yeshua? Interesting question. If Judas didn't betray uh, the Christ, it would have been somebody else, because uh, something had to have happened to get the uh, the wheel rolling. You know, 
Mm. Mm. Great answer. Uh, if uh, if Judas never betray Yeshua, then there will not be a redemption plan. And that is one of the things that uh, Yeshua himself told Peter. He said, I must go to Jerusalem that I, uh, that I will die. And Peter said, be far from it. It will not be so. And Yeshua looked right into the eyes of Peter as the man looked to his friend's eyes. And he said, get you behind me, Satan. Why? Because it was a plan of Satan not to have that redemption. Because if Yeshua died, there would be a redemption plan. Right. So that's the reason why it is impossible. It has to be fulfilled. So even though uh, uh, this uh, scripture had to be fulfilled for Yeshua to die. He was so. He, Judah could have avoid. But if he didn't die, as you said, if he didn't die, what would have happened? There would be no redemption plan. End of story. You would say, well, Yahweh will use somebody else. Then the, 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 the scripture will not align itself. Who's going to betray him? Peter? <laughs> so it was already destined for <laughs> Judah to do that. So if Judah didn't do it, let's put ourselves in Satan's shoes because that's exactly what it is. If he didn't do it, that was the plan of Satan. When Peter tell him, be far from you. Peter said, it will not happen. I'm sorry, boss, but you're not going to die. Then Shua said, you're a fool. That is the reason why I came. I came to die. I came to die. So what happened if, if Judas didn't betray Yeshua? It is impossible. That is the end game of Satan. Satan wanted to keep Yeshua all along on earth so we can live whatever we want to live, do whatever we want to do. There will not be a redemption plan. And who knows? Maybe we'll be here another 10,000 years. I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I, I agree with Joe that this thing had to have happened. Uh, but your question was, uh, did Judas have to be the one? Was that your question? Uh, no. no, it was, it was what would happen, happen if Judas didn't, didn't do it. Right, if Judas didn't do it. Okay, so if, if Judas didn't do it, would that have foiled the plan of God? You, you're like saying if Judas, Judas had no chance of repentance, he was doomed for hell from the time he was born. I know you're not saying that. <laughs> 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 you know. Nope. But he was a character that was used. I, I believe another character could have been used and the job and, and the redemption plan would have still gone forward because it had to have gone forward. There was no, there was no I, stopping but then, but then, but then, yeah. but then the scripture would uh, conflict itself because the prophet already spoke of Judas. Right. All these prophets right. already exactly. spoke of Judah. Uh -huh. So if Judah didn't do it, that, that would defeat the purpose because remember what Yeshua told uh, uh, John the Baptist. He said, look, let it be so. For what? For the scripture to be fulfilled. Amen. Mm -hmm. So if Judah didn't yes. do it, the scripture will not be fulfilled. So if the scripture is not fulfilled, yeah. what will happen? We will live for life forever in the land of mm -hmm. lawlessness because there is no redemption plan. Yep, and that's, I agree with that's, too because that's, I mean that's that's my take on that because that's yeah, what, and, and that's what Satan wanted. Satan did not want Yeshua to die. That's why. And it's no, yep. so, so Joe, so Joe, he will keep Yeshua on earth. So Joe, he will keep Yeshua on earth. That's why Yeshua look at him again. Let's go back to the scripture. He looked at Peter and he said, "Get you behind me, Satan." He didn't say, "Get you behind me, Peter." Now, Peter just declared, "Flesh and blood has not revealed this to you." Peter just heard from heaven. He heard from Yahweh. And all of a sudden, the same Peter said, you're not going to die? Wait a minute. You because you, you are working against the plans of Yahweh. But Yeshua understood that it wasn't Peter speaking. It was the enemy, Satan. He said, Satan, uh -huh, your yeah. plans are failed. Mm -hmm. So, brother, I think if uh, Judah didn't betray Yeshua, it will conflict the scriptures. And I believe that uh, what will happen... You know you know, Brother Joe, we're going to be living here for a long time. Brother Joe, if you can hear me out, I like what you're saying there. And, and I like how you reference prophecy mm -hmm. in the scripture because uh, the word of God does not conflict itself. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the New Testament and Old Testament, they, they, they're not in conflict. So when you mention prophecy, yeah. it made clearer sense because yes, sir. you mentioned prophecy, and in prophecy was the name Judas mentioned. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, that's a question. Yeah. In prophecy, was the J was the name Judas mentioned as the betrayer of Christ? <laughs> Two. Good yeah. question. That that is a good question. question. Uh -huh. And if it wasn't, and if it and if it was like here the 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 um narrative too, if, if Judas wasn't gonna betray him, the prophecy would the prophecy would have said something different. Yeah. You know, right. it would have been a different prophecy. 
it had been, you know, so, but it can had we, can to we get, in that way. Can we, just, because, can, we get, can we get to that prophecy that we are talking about? Mm -hmm. That, right. that, that oh, yes. it pertains yes. to Judah? That's a, that's... Of course, uh, you would say, well, where <laughs> you found that in the scripture? I would say, how did, how did uh, Yeshua know that Judah would be trained? Why you couldn't be Peter? Because Yeshua knew the prophecy, and he's a prophet. Mm -hmm. And we know that in that moment, though he's, a, he's God, but he took the human side because he's about to die. But at the same time, he operated also in the prophetic. So he told him, when he said, the one that is deep in, watch this. He said, the one that is deep in. And Jesus said, is that I? He said, yes, you spoke it. Just like when Pilate started. Yeah. He, said, uh, he said, my kingdom is out of this world. You said, well, uh, what did he say? Uh, then he said, Pilate said, are you a king? He said, but you just say it. So what did Yeshua say? Yeshua never give you a yes, right, yes or no answer. What he does is that he puts you in a position for you to speak the word directly. So when Jesus said, I'm not the one, he said, you said it. Same thing, Pilate. Pilate said, are you a king? He said, you just said it. So, of course, the word Judas has to be mentioned. Where do we find it? You show as a prophet. Yes, 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 yes. I agree with that. Because he even prophesied how Peter would be, would deny him three times. Hello? Yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, of course, I, know, I, I see, Brother Bishop, I see where you're going. You want the word Judas to be to be spoken. Oh, yes. No, no, not, not, no, not, no, not, no, 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 no. Okay. You want what that, there, that, you want not, the reference point of not, Judah where it's mentioned in, in a no, word? Not the not the word, not the name, <laughs> not the name of Judah, <laughs> but the character, the character. The character. Oh, that oh, that's, that's, that's a that's a beautiful that's a beautiful statement you just, just made. made. The, yeah, character. the character, yes, the character. Because yes. so, so we're, we're talking about we're, we're talking about many things. Talking about the Antichrist just now, right? We talked about many things, but we know that the Antichrist has a singular number. That represents his character. That's what the Bible says, right? The number of his name. So you're talking about the character of this individual. Mm -hmm. What makes him the Antichrist, and can he escape the fate? Because I, I think uh, Dr. B.J. asked the question: If Judas, if he was predestined to betray the Messiah, and my answer to that is no. My answer to that is no. When you come to the the the, the final moment of the Last Supper, Supper that Joe just mentioned, mentioned my, my brother, brother Joe just mentioned, mentioned with the, the dipping, dipping the dish. At that point, then yes, it was decided. But was it predetermined from the beginning of time? The answer to that is no. Yahweh will not do that to anybody. Because that defeats the support. That means that somebody was born just to betray Yeshua. Right. And so... What, what what happened was Yeshua set the parameters for a certain character type mm -hmm. to betray him. But all along, he did not want this to happen. And what's the reference for that? Uh, let's, let's hear Yeshua's own take on this, and we're going to go to the only chapter in the Bible that Yeshua actually is speaking, and it's John chapter 6. And it's centered around verse 66. So that's a 666, right? Mm -hmm. So this is the, this this is the big reveal of the transgressor, the person who is going to betray him. So in John chapter 6. Character of the transgressor. Yes, character of the transgressor. In John 6, starting verse 65, it says this. Yeshua said, that is the reason I said, if the Father does not bring a person to me, that one cannot come. So he's talking about salvation, but he's also talking about purpose and, and planning from the kingdom standpoint. Now, verse 66 says this. After Yeshua said this, and just to give you context, in this chapter, Yeshua is trying to explain to them about uh, eating his body and drinking his blood. Okay? Something that they could not understand. They, they couldn't fathom it. Uh, about him having the words eternal life, they, 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 they believe that he's speaking literal, and so they totally dismissed him as a Messiah from that standpoint. They, they, they cut him off from a teacher standpoint. They're like, this guy, he's, he's, off, he's off his head, you know. But in verse 66, it says, after Yeshua said this, many of his followers left him and stopped following him. So he had a complete dwindling of his entourage. Mm -hmm. Those that were with him, they saw the great miracles, the signs, and wonders. When he started talking about these deep mysteries, they checked out. They were like, okay, yeah, clearly this guy, he's going to hang him. They're going to hang him, and they're going to kill anybody who's associated with him. So I think it's now time for us to abandon the ship and just see what's going to become of, of this character. 
But, but verse 67 says, Yeshua asked the 12 followers, because this is all who was left. He said, do you want to leave too? Simon Peter answered him, you know Peter's going to be the one answer. He said, Yeshua, who would we go to? You have the words that give eternal life. So Peter is answering for the 12. He's saying, we are all going to support you in this mission. Does Yeshua accept what Peter says? Yeshua says this, this is verse 69, we believe and know that you are the Holy One from God, that's Peter. Then Yeshua answered them, I chose all 12 of you, but one of you is a devil. So Yeshua is saying, I, I had 12 of you in my, in my inner circle as the entourage of the entourage. And in that circle I had a select three, and in that select three, a select one. But he's saying, out of the 12 of you, if I can line you up, put you in a lineup, one of you is a devil. And John is talking in hindsight now. In the moment, John's not thinking this, but in hindsight, verse 71 says, Yeshua was talking about Judas the son of Simon Iscariot. Now listen to the tense of this sentence. He said, Judas was one of the twelve, but later he was going to turn against Yeshua. So at this point in John chapter 6, all of the disciples are on board. There is not a traitor in the midst of them. But Yeshua is saying that there is a character type within the twelve of you, and one of you is going to betray me. So how did Judas become the one who was to betray Yeshua? Whenever Yeshua would have a dialogue or you have to have correction with somebody, with a disciple, for example, it was Peter. When Peter was like, Yeshua said, I'm going to the cross. And Peter said, no, you're not going to the cross. And Yeshua was like, get behind me, Satan, because you don't have my or the Father's interest at heart. You think about your own ideas. And Peter had to humble himself and submit himself to what Yeshua was doing. That was always the case with the disciples. They would humble themselves and they would say, you know what, I'm going to submit to what Yeshua said. Yeah. Judas' main problem is the, is the problem with the church right now. Let me Submission. Take, say it again? Submission. No, no, the, the, problem, the, the number one problem is gossip. Mm -hmm. And I'm say, how did you get there? In Romans, Romans chapter, chapter 1, one. You, you read Romans, Romans chapter 1, Romans, Romans chapter 1, Paul is laying out all the issues with the, with the body, the ecclesia. Uh, one, one of the main issues when you get down to between chapter 20, uh, verse 26 and verse 30, he starts listing lying and all these other things, hatred and, you know, not submitting to authority, obedience, and gossip finds its way into that list. And so for a lot of us, we think gossip is harmless. But what does gossip really do? So gossip starts as you speaking to somebody else, right? About a matter without going to address the person with the matter. Now, if you are having a conversation about something and the two of you decide, listen, you need to go to this party, as, as James said, you, you have an, uh, an issue with somebody, you go to that person and you take one of the elders or the brothers and you, you talk to that person, you win that person back, uh, sorry, the fall, right? Gossip is when you Talk to the person and you decided amongst yourself that this is what that individual is doing. And you have now created an idea of this person. And so when you speak to that person now, you already judge that person's actions. And so you now, that, that idea now dictates whether you submit to that person or you reject that person. So uh, case in point, somebody has a, a, a loaf of bread. And all of us are here in this Zoom room, right? But the person goes to Joe, the Coleman Embassy, and they say, this bread is for my brother whom I love, Joe, right? And they give the bread to Joe. Now, Dr. Burchard and myself now, we come out of the Zoom room, and we start talking amongst ourselves. And we're like, you know, who does that person think Joe is, you know, and Joe is this and Joe is that, and why couldn't they give me the bread or, or you the bread, you know, and why is he beloved? And so we start developing an idea. Now, before the bread issue, we had no problems with Joe. But because we've entertained this dialogue now and gossip, now when we see Joe, we don't want to talk to Joe. Joe has no idea what's going on, so he's like, you know, did I do something to you? Did I offend you? You know, what's going on? Why is there, uh, you know, a hindrance to our relationship? And so ministries are brought down through gossip, 
relationships are destroyed through gossip. And, and, and so you can actually topple countries through gossip, you know, from a political standpoint, they call it propaganda, right? Now, propaganda is just a fancy word for gossip. And so you can destroy all of this, right, from gossip. And so what's happening with, with, with Judas is Judas has now entered into gossiping with the Pharisees and the teachers of the law and some of the disciples who aren't completely on board with Yeshua. Mm-hmm. And, and so, so they're talking, talking about what Yeshua was doing and what Judas feels like Yeshua should be doing. And you see it come out in that same Passion Week when Yeshua is being anointed as the Lamb. Judas is looking at Yeshua and he doesn't go to Yeshua and say, uh, Yeshua, uh, explain to me what's going on. How come you allow this person to anoint you? Mm-hmm. Remember now what gossip does. It formulates an idea and then it projects that idea on the individual. Right. And so he immediately says to Yeshua, why this waste? So he has already conceived in his mind that Yeshua is a wasteful person and what he's doing doesn't make sense. And so I cannot fully trust him because what, what the, the, the directive that he's under now, the motive, motivation behind what he's doing doesn't line up with what the kingdom is doing. And so I can no longer support him, but I don't want to leave. Gossipers don't ever like to leave. They always want to be a part of what's going on so that they can go and, and generate more talking about what's going on. Because they need to continually feed. They need to feed this beast. Awesome is a beast. And so, and so Yeshua rebukes him. And Judas never repents. In that moment, never repents. He never changed his perspective of who Yeshua was as the Messiah. And so now they're in the meeting, the final meeting, and everybody's sitting around the table. And the Bible doesn't say that Judas betrayed Yeshua. The Bible actually tells you that before the betrayal, Satan entered Judas. Yes. And so it's really Satan who's using Judas as a tool of betrayal. Yes. But this is Satan organizing and concocting this scheme. But it all is centered around gossiping. And so Judas now, Yeshua tells him, whatever you decide to do, go and do it quickly. And now Judas goes back to the camp that he's in, and they formulate this idea of how they're going to tackle the Messiah. Mm-hmm. The worst part about it is they destroy Yeshua through worship. And that is, that is an indictment against us in 2021. When you talk about the different levels of worship, the highest level of worship is what they call in in the Hebrew tongue and in the the Greek tongue, I believe it is proskinu. And proskinu means to bow yourself before the king and to throw him a kiss. So when you look at the ancient, in the ancient kingdoms, when the king would roll, ride down the promenade, that's, that's the royal highway, right? All of the subjects would be on the side of the street, right? And they would be blowing kisses to him. It's a form of worship, an act of, of submission, saying, you know what? All of our blessings flow from you. So we offer you this worship through, through our blowing the kiss. And so Yeshua's in the garden, and Judas comes to him, and Judas kisses him. Yes. And Yeshua is surprised by the betrayal to the point where he says to him, do you betray the Son of Man with a kiss? Right. You know, so in, in other words, are you betraying the Son of Man with worship? And, and so we, we have perfected our idea and our concept of what worship is, but our worship really, uh, most of the times, if we're honest, is a betrayal to what Yahweh really wants to happen. Uh, Isaiah understood this quite well because Yahweh told Isaiah, he said, I want you to stop the sacrifices, stop the fast, stop the worship. I don't want any more of your offerings. Yahweh said, it's detestable to me. As a nation of Israel, just stop. Because what you're doing is too much. I want you to go back to the bare minimum of what I requested. The bare minimum. And so right now, God is stripping a lot of ministries because he wants those ministries to go back to the bare minimum. You know, forget about all the elaborate uh, shows of affection that really don't have the Spirit of God in it. Go back to the basics because the basics is what I'm coming for. And so if you want to really satisfy God's desire for your life in 2021, you've got to strip yourself of all of the things that you think God wants from you and go back to him and ask him in earnestness, Yahweh, what do you want from me? Simply, what do you want from me? What, what can I do to make you smile today? 
you know? And so we, we have to get away from that mindset. I'm telling you, gossip is one of the most dangerous, vile, wickedest things. Uh, the last time I think it's mentioned is in 2 Timothy chapter 1, I believe. Uh, but Yeshua, when he's talking about those who do not make, make it into the new city, New Jerusalem, he mentioned those who practice a lie, those who, who make a lie. You know, when he's talking about the slanders, the slanderers, which is a form of gossip. He's talking about the cowards, those that do not support him openly. And I can tell you that the 12, out of the 12 disciples, Judas was not the only coward. Nor was he the only betrayer. Mm. Yahweh told Peter to his face, he said, you are going to deny me three times. Denying is a betrayal. That's a cowardice act. Yes. And then he said, on top of that, the rest of you, when you see the head being taken away, the rest of you are going to scatter. So it was an indictment against all of them. The only person who was present at the crucifixion was John. Yes. And Yeshua turned over the, the parentage of his mother to John. He was like, John, this is your mother. Mother, this is your son. And I'm going to think that was the most heartbreaking thing that Mary heard. Because from a, from a Hebrew standpoint, the eldest son was to take care of the mother. So when the father died, if the father were to die, then the, the, the wife, the widow who was left, she would either go back to her home and her father take care of her or her eldest brother take care of her. Or if her sons were a means, then the eldest son would be responsible of taking care of the mother. But Yeshua bypassed Judas, who wrote the book of Judas, his younger brother, half-brother. He bypassed James. Uh, and he bypassed Simon, who those were his three blood brothers. And he turned his mother over to John, who was the youngest disciple, who was even a part of the family yes. lineage. Yeah. You know, so mm -hmm. Yeshua broke a lot of uh, a lot of traditions in his death that we don't appreciate now in 2021. But he broke a lot of traditions, and so in 2021, we want to really honor him and pass over the way that we that that he wants, the way that he prescribed. Then it comes with stripping away. You know, strip down. And so I, I thank you all for being a part of this discussion. I thank you for welcoming us into your home. Thank you for uh, coming and be a part of our home. We are all gathered around the table together in fellowship. And I appreciate that so much. But as we, as we, as we uh, close this, I have one more question for us. But before I ask that question, I, I want to... Uh, pass this on to our good brother, Brother Joe, who is going to walk us through communion and what it means. Because you cannot bring in the new year. You cannot bring in the new year of Yahweh without entering into communion with, uh, with him. And so I, I would give everybody an opportunity, if you don't have uh, the sacraments at hand, if you don't have the bread and you don't have uh, what I would call grape juice, then, uh, you know, a way for a cracker, a slice of bread will do, um, some juice will do. It doesn't have to be grape juice. You know, don't, don't, don't get into the orthodox thinking that everything has to be, you know, there's a certain way for Yahweh to work. It does not have to be. It's about the heart of the matter that Yahweh is really investigating right now in 2021. And so I want you to get your, 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 your items together and... We, we really want to rededicate our lives to him. You know, because I know a lot of us may not even have realized that this was the new year. You know, we're looking at January 1st, 2021 as the new year, but we're not really focused on what God is describing as his new year. And he wants to bring us in. Anytime God says it's time for something to happen, I'm on board. Yeah. I don't want to be a part of the old. Yeah, I don't want to be a part of the old. You know, Yahweh will never see me put my hand up and say, you know what, Yahweh, you talk about the new thing, but I am comfortable with the old now. I don't want to be a part of what God is doing now. And I don't want to be a part of his progressive plan for what he's doing in the future. And so this is how you prepare yourself for the future. So, uh, my brother Joe, please, take it away. But I'm saying you could close the building. Amen, amen. So, uh, yeah, this is a, a very intimate, intimate moment. You know, uh, I'm going to read a few scriptures and then we're going to together as a, a body uh, partake of this very, very, very covenant that Yeshua is issue for us. 
And it begins in Matthew 26, um, verse 26. It says, while they were eating, Yeshua took some bread and thanked God. And he broke it. And he gave it to his followers and said, take this bread and eat it. This is my body. Then Yeshua took a cup and thanked God. And he gave it to his followers and said, every one of you drink this. This is my blood, which is a new agreement, a new covenant that Yahweh makes with his people. You see, this blood is poured out for many to forgive their sin. I tell you this, I will not drink of this fruit of mine again until that day when I drink it, it new with you in my father's kingdom. And after singing the animal, they went out to the Mount of Olives. Two things I want to mention before we partake of this thing, and it's very crucial. He says, as he took the cup, he mentioned a new covenant. A new covenant. Uh, what Yeshua was doing is that it was not really abolishing Passover because Passover happens once a year. But then to really understand this new covenant, we have to go back to what Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians 12. And uh, we know Paul wrote that strategically. And um, we know how uh, um, he laid it out. But this is what uh, Paul is saying as he broke it down. He says, you know, and I'm going to take it from the end. He said, therefore, he said, as often as you eat, this bread and drink this cup, he said, you shall remember it. Yeshua's death until he come. He said, you shall remember his death. Now, if we were to ask that all these feasts, we celebrate these feasts, yes, we celebrate all these feasts. Which one is the greatest? All of them are the greatest. But there is one that he said, he said you shall remember. Why? Because as we went to the questionnaire and we see what happened if Yeshua didn't die? There will not be redemption. So Paul is telling us that the death of Yeshua, the bloodshed on the hill of Golgotha, it is so potent that we must remember how as often as you do this. So in the new covenant, it's not something that you do one day and you forget. No, you see, if you can do it three times a day, do it. If you can get with brethren and a break bread, uh, uh, do communion every day, do it. Because often, according to the Queen's language, it means as many times. How many times can you do it a day? I don't know how many times you can do it. But if you can do it 10 times, you do it. So that's what the words mean, as often as you do it. So as often as we do, we shall remember his death till he come. And as we're doing this on this Passover, is to remember how powerful one of the Godheads, Yeshua, left his throne and came down, take human flesh, and to be slain for the redemption. What a love. What a love. And Amen. that's what we ought to remember until it comes. But then Matthew didn't stop there. Verse 30 tell us, Yeshua said clearly that he will not drink of the fruit of the vine again till he returns. What yeah. a staple. Yeah. My hallelujah to the land. Oh, glory. What a simple. You know what he's told them? He said, no, this is so powerful. This is such a new covenant that I'm doing. But I'm not just doing this new covenant for only you people, only you humans, uh, and call me just a guardian. But I'm doing it for myself uh, that I'm not going to taste uh, of the fruit of the vine. Uh, so we do it together again in my father's kingdom. Glory to the Lamb. What are you saying? So as you and I remember his death till he comes, Yeshua also is remembering his coming. Oh, hallelujah. What a connection. Oh, hallelujah. What a time. Yes. 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 Remember his coming. Oh, glory to the Lamb. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Glory to the Lamb. He said, I am not going to drink any fruit of the vine till we do it together. Brothers and sisters, this, this is intimate. Yeshua's death on the cross is intimate to him. Mm -hmm. So he's telling us that he will drink with us. Not only with Peter, not only with Paul, not only with Abraham on the head of Melchizedek. No, yes. you and I. Yes, you and I. 
when the trumpet sound, you and I are going to be present at the table and we're going to treat this together. Glory yeah. to the Lamb. Yes. yes. This is an exciting moment. Yes. yes. An exciting up. moment. Amen. That's an exciting yeah. moment. Powerful picture. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So we're going to go right into it. But yes. before we do it, Paul wrote those in, uh, in 1 Corinthians 11. First, Paul took time. And uh, as we see the church most of the time, they, they read it after the end. Why did Paul write it after, at the end? I don't know how this was written, uh, but I know one thing that about uh, the Hebrew language is like Arabic. They write backwards, so it means that it seems like they write at the end before they write the beginning. How does it work? Mm -hmm. I don't know. Mm -hmm. But this is what Paul says. Paul tells us that he said, this is what he said. In verse 27, he said, Therefore, whoever eats this bread and drink this cup of Yahweh in a worthy manner, he said, will be guilty of the body and the blood of Yahweh. But then he just started to say, but let every man examine himself. So let him eat of this bread and drink this cup. For he who eats and drinks it unworthy drinks judgment to himself. But then Paul didn't stop there. He said, not discerning what? Yeshua's body, the Lord's body. But then I love what he says in verse 30. And that's the key. You are wondering why people are dying and, and, and why the church is having cancer and everybody dying. This is the reason, verse 30. He said, for this reason, he said, many are weak and sick among you and many are sleeping. Why? Because we are drinking damnation. In other words, if you're drinking unworthy, that's what uh, uh, Solomon tells us in the book of Proverbs. He said, can a man take hot coal into his bosom and I get burned? Can you take fire into your body and I get burned? It's impossible. So Paul is telling us that if we do it unworthy, <coughs> we die. That's how serious this is. This is serious. It's better you don't do it than you do it. Because now you are guilty of the judgment. So as brothers and sisters, as we are ready on this night, observing Passover and sharing this new covenant that Yeshua issue in that communion. Let us take a few seconds. Literally. Because I don't want you to die. Every day, every minute that I get, I repent. You know, I love the church folks because they're too holy for me. I'm not holy. As long as I'm on this vessel, repentance and humility is the key for my survival. Yes. Yeshua share it and Paul share it and that's what I'm going to hold on to. Church folks, when it comes to repentance, oh, what am I repenting for? They're too righteous for me. Mm -hmm. They're too righteous for me. But I know that because I go 100 miles an hour in my life, there come a moment when I probably had a glitch, didn't realize it. Mm -hmm. So repentance is part of my lifestyle. Mm -hmm. But I've done something and I've done nothing. But I want to make sure that I am in right standing. So let us take a few seconds, a few seconds, as Paul said, examine your heart, because I don't want you to die. I don't want you, I don't, in, the, in, in this moment, there is no collateral damage. There is no casualty. All of us are going to make it to the new Jerusalem, and none of us will suffer, and none of us will be sick, but we'll all inherit the blessing that Yahweh has for us. So let us take a few seconds, and uh, let us examine ourselves, and then we're going to partake of this. Make sure you got your, 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 uh, your crackers, your bread, as the brother say, your drink, and get it ready, and then now uh, we're going to dive right into it. But let's take these few moments and examine our hearts. This is personal. It's called self-examination. I don't have to examine you. I'm going to exa examine me. Amen, amen. 
So I'm going back to Matthew 26. You see, while they were eating, woman, uh, before we begin, make sure you got your, you got your stuff. Uh, mm -hmm. My help me, they look like she's sleeping on the job. No. So then what is, I don't see no, no cracker. I don't see nothing in my hand. <laughs> So, sorry, brothers, you know, I'm, I'm about to say speak out loud. I, I was thinking out loud. Yeah, look closely, Joe, it's there. there. <laughs> so make, make, sure you got, make sure you got your stuff. My husband was supposed to help me, but she ain't helped me, but I will help myself. Make sure you have make sure you have your stuff. Okay, I have my stuff, so I'm I'm ready. I'm I'm, I'm ready now. Now I'm prepared. Yeah. I've examined my heart. I've repented. Yahweh, I am ready. Let's do it. Yeshua, we're ready for this uh very privileged moment. Yes. So while they were eating, Yeshua took some of the bread and he thanked Yahweh. Father, we thank you for this very moment. Yes. We thank you, Hallelujah, for the body of Yeshua. Yes. Yeshua told us in John 6 that if you do not eat my flesh, oh hallelujah, you cannot go where I go. <coughs> the body that was broken on a cross. And he took, he broke it, and he gave it to them. And he said, This bread is my body. Eat it. So, brother, this is the body of Yeshua that was broken on the hill of Golgotha. Let us partake of this body that was broken. Let us partake of this body that suffer all the lashes, all the torture for our <coughs> eat, and let us eat all of it. In the name of Yeshua Mashiach. Amen. Amen. Now, in the same manner, he took the cup. And this is what he said. He said, this cup is a new covenant in my blood. This cup represents the blood of Yeshua. And you and I know how powerful yes. that blood is. Yes. That blood is so powerful. That it breaks every generational curse over our life. Yes, yes. thank you. That blood is so powerful yes. that it brings healing into our body. Yes. That yes. blood is Jesus. so powerful that it protects us yes. from arms and dangers. Yes. Yes. No evil yes. can come near. Amen. That blood yes. is so powerful. Yes, yes. Yeah. That it is our source of survival. We can yes. not without that blood. It is not just the blood of bulls, but it's mm. the blood of Yeshua Amashi. Yes. yes. That was shed to redeem us. For he yes. will tell us that without shedding of the blood, there is no remission of sin. No. His blood is the blood of Yeshua. Thank you, Lord. Allow thank us you. to be in right standing before Thank you. Thank you. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So this is a new covenant yes. that Yeshua made by sharing his precious blood. Yes. That blood is so powerful. That he still stands for yes. 2,000 years until he returns. Yes. Yes. That's the power of the blood. So, brothers and sisters, you and I, as we take up this cup, let us drink it in remembrance of the blood Yeshua shed for us. Drink it and drink it all of it. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Amen. Hallelujah. This is a, this is a moment Thank of victory. You, Thank you. Yes. This is a moment of celebration. Thank you, Yeshua. Thank you, Lord. Thank you. Hallelujah. Thank you. 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 Thank
Hallelujah. Thank you. Yes. I give you glory. Praise your name. Thank you. Thank you for your blood. There is no me without you, Yeshua. So I give you glory. Thank you. Yes. Hallelujah. 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 Give you glory. Give you glory. Give you glory. Thank you, Lord. Praise your name. Glory to the Lamb that was slain. Yes. Yes. Glory. Ah, man. Hallelujah. Yes, sir. Yes. Yes. Such a good God. Amen. Can I have it, brother? Take over. Uh, let, let me, me tell you, let me tell you something, something about this book that we read. Uh, you can't no longer look at this book. You know, we call it a Bible. Yes, we know it's a Bible. And we know that it was written by holy men of God who were inspired by God to write his word. We know these things, right? I think that for a lot of us, we cannot connect to the word as we should because we don't see ourselves in the word. But let me tell you, even though you don't see your name listed in the Bible, the Bible has a lot to say about you. Yes. Because in the context of the word, we are introduced to the Holy Spirit and the word of God. And the Bible is talking about you. And in the same month of March, the Bible is talking about you in 2021. And I'm telling you, the Bible only has great things to say about you. There is no predestination that says that you are not supposed to be made in heaven. That says that you're supposed to be living in sin. That says that you're supposed to be living in bondage. In fact, the Bible says the opposite about you. The Bible calls you a royal priest. It calls you somebody who is peculiar. It calls you somebody who is holy. It calls you somebody who is righteous. It calls you somebody who is supposed to experience the greater than the abundance that God wants to provide you. But you have to get to a position in this life where you see what the Word of God is saying about you and you come into agreement with what the Word is saying. So as long as you live alienated from the Word, you will not experience the greater than. And so these feasts that we enter into, these times of celebration, these times of just coming together and, 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 and pouring ourselves into the Word, Putting ourselves into the context of the word, asking the deep questions, you know, like what would happen if this didn't happen, and you know, what would be the, the case with this? We do these things because that's how we become sharpened. Yeah. So this is the year of celebration. This is the year of entering into Goshen. This is the year of being protected Amen. by the Father. This is the year of being sharpened. Yeah. But you have to start getting into this word, and it has to come alive in you. Yeah. You know, the Bible says that the word is sharper than any two-edged sword. And it goes through the flesh, and it goes through the bone, and it goes down into the marrow. Well, the marrow is literally the atomic vessels of your body. Yes. That's like the microorganisms of your body. That's how your body is supposed to function. If your bone marrow isn't producing the, the, the correct uh, blood, because blood is producing the bone marrow, then the entire body is sick. Yes. And for the last 5,000 years, the doctors, all the way back in Egypt, they experienced this dance practice from the doctorship called uh, Blood Letting, and, and Dr. Leonardo Comer is on. He's one of the expert doctors in the field. But Blood Letting is simply when you went to the doctor and you said, oh, I'm not feeling good, they would literally drain the blood from your body. Drain the blood from your body and, and infuse new blood into the body because they believe that the sickness, you know, according to Yahweh's standard, this was these outside doctors now trying to uh, put God into a box, yeah. right? And say, okay, well, this is what God said, this is what the Jews believe, so you know, this is what we're going to do. We're going to take the blood out and then you're going to put new blood in. And even up to George Washington, he had experienced twice. The last time that he died, uh, blood letting, where they would literally. Uh, take, take all the blood out of the body because they figured that's, that's where the sickness was. But, but Yeshua, Yeshua is saying you don't have to go through this bloodletting process. No. The process doesn't make sense. Mm -hmm. it, it, it's not sustainable. It, it, it's not a practice that you're supposed to be operating in the 21st century. But a lot of people, you know, they believe that this is legitimate. You know, and so that's what happens to a lot of people spiritually. You know, mm -hmm. people experience the spiritual bloodletting where they're like, okay, it's the ministry's fault. So let me get out of this ministry, go to the next ministry, and then I won't have the same experience that I had. And then they, they realize after they jumped to about five or six ministries that, hey, yeah. the problem is me. 
Send the marriages, you know, bloodletting marriages. You know, this marriage isn't working, so let me jump out of this marriage and then get into this marriage. Mm -hmm. And then after about three or four divorces, they realize, hey, you know what? I think I really am the problem. And then, yeah, you know, that was right? Yeah. I tell you, this marriage is the problem. And you know, and so you go through these bloodletting, these bloodletting exercises. You know, and, and it becomes, it takes a physical toll on you, it takes an emotional toll on you, and by the time you're finished, you're exhausted. You have nothing of value to give to the kingdom. But God is saying this is not your experience in 2021. God wants you to come into communion with him, into fellowship with him. He wants you to enjoy the feast that he, uh, that he prescribes to you so that he can get you the help that you need. And so if you want to be successful, if you want to get above and beyond what the status quo is saying. Because, you know, a lot of directives are coming from the government. The government is saying, okay, we're going to be dealing with this virus for another two years. And they're saying that they're going to lose a lot of jobs. And then the banks are saying, you know, we have to uh, become very cautious with how we lend. And if you want to start a new business, then you have to find some kind of wealthy donor because the banks are like, you know, if you don't have a job, if you don't have any kind of income, then we can't invest in you. And people are saying, you know, we're not going to give you more, a mortgage because we're not sure if you're going to have a job next week. And so things become very constricting mm -hmm. and confining if you are not dependent on the Word of God. And so the Bible right now in 2021 is saying about you, you are more than a conqueror. Oh, yeah. You are the head and not the yeah. You're the lender and not the borrower. Yeah. And you have to begin to say these things about yourself yes. so that they become active and alive. Mm -hmm. And I think that's it. I, I believe that that's a great note for us to end on. Yes. Next Sunday, well, sorry, next evening, tomorrow, Saturday, 6 p.m., we're going to be on same platform with Apostle Dai. Mm -hmm. And we've had some amazing experiences with her since January rolled in January 2021. Every Sunday evening at 6 p.m., she is a woman who's hearing from God, authentic words from God. Authentic prayer points from God. Now, this particular Sunday evening, uh, we've got two speakers right here. They're here in the house right now. Right now. Uh, my sister, Prophetess A.K. Smith, she's been very quiet this evening. I think that she's saving uh, Holy Spirit juice for tomorrow. She's like, you're not going Tonight, you come back, back tomorrow, and I'm going to tell you yeah. what that says, Yahweh. Yeah. Yeah. So, like AK-47 AK in the Spirit. <laughs> So, so she and, and our good, good brother, Apostle Joe, are going to be, uh, gonna be on tomorrow evening along with some other folks. But they're going to be talking specifically about acceleration in the kingdom for 2021 as well as getting into Goshen. Because, you know, we talked about yes. Exodus out of Egypt and how the Israelites had to get out of Egypt. I want, I want you to understand something. This is a higher order concept. But, but you should expect nothing less when you come to the deep ecclesia. Yes. We don't talk about surface things, we go deep. So from, from Genesis to the Gospels, time moved forward. And so you went through the experience of Adam and Eve in the garden, and then you had Cain and Abel, and, and then you had Seth and Cain, who had these two nations. And those two nations came together, and they didn't experience the violence, and that led to Nimrod. And then Nimrod led to Egypt, and Egypt led to Moses and Aaron. And then you had the kings and the prophets, and then you had Greece and Babylon, all those things, right? It was a progressive move forward up to the Gospels. The way that we see time is we see time as the Gospels moves forward to Revelation, right? So we say, okay, from Genesis to Revelation, that's the way time moves. Unfortunately, that's not the case. The way the time is moving is when Yeshua came, he came not as the son of Yahweh. He had a specific title. He called himself the last Adam. Yes. So Yeshua is not moving forward to Revelation. Yeshua is moving backward to Genesis. So what has to happen is you have to have all the experiences that they walk through in a backward motion of time. So instead of experiencing, you know, uh, the flood, and then Egypt, and then the kings, you would experience the kings, and then Egypt, and then the flood, when you're moving backward in time. So that's how we're moving. So you're probably wondering, well, I thought the, the Israelites left Goshen to go to the promised land. Why are we talking about Goshen in 2021? Isn't that backward? Yes, that's the point. 
because, because they, they left Goshen, Goshen to go to the, the promised land, land and, and the promised land, land got corrupted, but to get, get back to Yeshua, we have to pass back through Goshen to get to Eden, which is paradise, which is the New Jerusalem, to get to the second Adam. So we're moving backward toward Goshen, the, the last Adam. Okay, and, and so, so that's where we are right now. We're literally on the verge of entering into Goshen. Once you get into Goshen, then all of the plagues that they experienced in Exodus happen again in Revelation. I spoke about this before. The coronavirus is plague one of the ten. The sad thing about the first three plagues, the first three plagues in Egypt, they happen to both the Israelites and the Egyptians. Only the last seven and in the last seven, where the people in Goshen saved. Yes. So what does that mean for us in 2021? If this is plague one, it's happening to everybody. The coronavirus, there was nobody who said, okay, uh, we have 30 million Christians or believers, and so these 30 million people are spared because they believe in Yeshua. The coronavirus was taking everybody out. The sinners, those who believe, everybody was fair game, the coronavirus. The next two plagues, will be just, just like that. that. It's going to happen to those who are believers and those who are unrighteous. It's not going to happen to you, though, because you're above righteousness. You are the elect of God. And so the elect of God is like a cream of the crop. It's like if the class has to be destroyed, then I'm going to take the top three students. So you want to be the top three students, right? You want to be the elect. That's how you get to Goshen. You find those who are the elect. And you piece together what God is saying. Because God is not going to drop everything to Sarah. He's not going to drop everything to me. He's not going to drop everything to Joe or Anika or Corey or Chad or BJ or Shanika. God is going to explain different things. He pours out a spirit on all flesh. And then the sons and daughters prophesy. So the prophetic is very important right now. Because when you start to prophesy, and I start to prophesy, Paul said, Get into a congregation and let two or three persons prophesy and then let the prophets decide what is accurate. So that's where we are. We are the season now where we need all of the prophets of God to rise up so that we can start putting the puzzle, the pieces of the puzzle yes. together yeah. to find where Goshen is. I have an idea where Goshen is. Uh, I'm telling you, I won't be left out of Goshen. My house will not be left out of Goshen. You know? And so. I'm, when, when, as I find more information, I provide the information to those who are listening. Whoever has an idea, let them hear what the Spirit is saying to the Ecclesia. And so, tomorrow evening, tomorrow evening, you want to be on this call. You want to get your friends. You want to tell them, listen, we're talking about Goshen. And if they say to you, listen, I don't know what Goshen is. That doesn't make sense to me. Tell them they need to be there so they can understand what Goshen is. And they can understand what acceleration is. Because not only do we need to find Goshen, we have to find it fast. Mm -hmm. There's no time left. There's no time left. No time to waste. So thank you so much. I enjoyed this Passover. Yeah. Uh, I, I, I look forward to the time when we can all gather in one place. Oh, yeah. And we can come together. Oh, yeah. We can share. You know, and we can have some real good debates on, on, on Yahweh without any internet yeah. uh, connectivity <laughs> issues. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So thank you so much. Any, any closing thoughts, please? Anybody else wants to add to anything? Let's get some Goshen and let's dream dreams. Hey, <laughs> yeah, we're going to yeah. enter tonight. <laughs> Amen. Amen. Let's get to Goshen. Goshen. Goshen is the place to be. Yes. Amen. <laughs> Well, I guess we can close with the song. And as you, as you feel that you can, you can depart. This is what we do. We just play music and, and sing songs to Yahweh. Uh, and then when Yahweh is done, then we, then we go and watch YouTube and Netflix. Yahweh is doing Yahweh is Bless your name, God. Praise you're so sweet and special to us. We love you. Nothing less than Jesus.
thank, thank you very much, my good people. I feel so refreshed and just it's great yes. to be alive. Yes. Great to be alive now. Yes. It's great, great time, time to be alive. Exciting times to see what y'all is doing. I can't wait to see the greater manifestations of his powers. Might as well hear the testimonies from you and what God has done in your life and what God continues to do uh, for you and through you. Yes. And yeah, tomorrow's going to be exceptional. Can't wait. Can't wait. All right, family. See you guys. Love you. Love you so much. Thank you. Come on, thank you. Thank you. Oh, wait a minute. Before we leave, one of the things that Yahweh said must be done, he said that we must blow the shofar during every holiday. Yes. We must blow the shofar for every holiday. Yes, we're going to get it right now. Every, every sacrifice. He said, these things must be done. You must go to the shofar. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Hey, listen. Is Chad, is Chad still on? No. Is Chad leave home? Oh. No. I was going to tell him to go and get his trumpet. <laughs> uh. I'm to. Yes. You must go to the shofar. Yahweh's name. Yahweh's name. Praise him. Praise him. These things must be done. Give God praise. Mm -hmm. Yes. <laughs> here it comes, here it comes, John. I have, I have to say, oh, Nicola has one too, oh, look at that, I have, I have one too, oh, oh, boy, the whole family, the whole family, the whole family has shown, oh, no, 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 no. The, the, the cool one is, the cool one is, y'all, y'all gonna leave this one, y'all gonna leave this one, my goodness, all right, ready, yes, ready, <laughs> <laughs> Yes, we must. Yes, get the show far. Yes, yes. <laughs> please, praise Yahweh. JJ with his, oh yeah, we get it. I'm telling you, awesome. <laughs> wow. Awesome. All right, my people, you guys continue to have a wonderful evening. Uh, enjoy some lamb on me. You go to the farmer's market tomorrow, you ask them for the biggest rack of lamb that they have. And they ask you, who sent you? Tell them to put it on my tab. Tell them to put it on my tab, right? Yes. Get yourself some lamb. 
praise Yahweh for that. All right, guys. See you guys tomorrow evening. Yes. Awesome time. Yes. yes. Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat we had a theme song. It was so good to hear that tonight. That other theme song? <laughs> <laughs> uh, oh, nice. oh, oh boy. Yes. Oh boy. I, I'm, 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 uh, next time I do it, I'll play the song. <laughs> mm, this, this internet is misbehaving. 